It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. We've got a great panel for you. Dwight Silverman from the Houston Chronicle is here. Uh, Brian McCullough from the Tech Meme Ride Home. And we haven't seen this guy in a long time. Founder of Engadget and Gizmodo, Peter Rojas, joins us for the first time. It might be in more than a decade. We'll take a look at the new Galaxy Z Fold 2. We'll wait through most of the show to see if TikTok's been banned. Spoiler alert, not yet. <laughs> and the Rebel Alliance, a.k.a. Epic, Spotify, and Tile, fighting Apple. It's all coming up next on Twit. This Week in Tech is brought to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees LastPass can ensure they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether employees are working in the office or remotely. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit. This Week in Tech, episode 790, recorded Sunday, September 27th, 2020. The Snaggletooth Network. This episode of This Week in Tech is brought to you by LastPass. Let LastPass improve your employees' experience while safeguarding your business from cyber threats. LastPass is the number one password manager. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. And by CashFly. Give your users the seamless online experience they want. Power your site or app with CashFly's CDN and be 30% faster than the competition. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. And by Masterclass. Online classes taught by the world's greatest minds. Get unlimited access to every Masterclass. And as a listener, you'll get 15% off the annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash twit2. And by ExtraHop. ExtraHop helps you keep your business secure and available with SaaS-based cloud-native network detection and response. Learn more about how ExtraHop stops breaches 70% faster and experience the free trial for yourself at extrahop.com slash twit. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show we cover the week's news with a panel of tech experts. <laughs> That's the worst neologism ever. Tech experts. Here's a tech expert from Tech Burger, Mr. Dwight Silverman of the Houston Chronicle. Hello, oh, tech expert. Leo, I don't know if I want to be a tech expert. <laughs> That's the worst. <laughs> that is the worst. I, I've never called you that before, and now I'm I'm sorry. No, please don't again. <laughs> I apologize. That was not not intentional. Uh, good to see you, though, Dwight. And we were just talking about old be times. Thank you. Because we got an old timer here with us. Peter Rojas was a guest on many <laughs> twits back when he was at Engadget and Gizmodo. And uh, of late, he's been uh, a big time investor at Betaworks. Small time investor. Small time investor at Betaworks. Uh, it's so good to see you again, Peter. It's good to be back. I, I was thinking the first time I was on was. Has it been 14 years? Probably. Yeah. The show's only 15 years old. Yeah. You were on early. I remember being early. on in the cottage. Yeah. And we, I mean, by the way, we always loved having you on and your expertise. And it's just great to see you. I guess the last, since we've seen you last, you've had a few kids. <laughs> Keep having children. <laughs> <laughs> Get, keeping busy. It's just so great. Anyway, welcome uh, to the show. Welcome back. Thank uh, you. Thrilled that we uh, were able to get you. And also thrilled to see Brian McCullough, host of Tech Memes Ride Home podcast, our resident internet historian. How are things uh, with you, Brian? Uh, everything's still kicking over. Uh, apparently not as smoky over here as it is where you are. Oh, man. We're, we're just a mess. We're just a mess. It got, there's another, yet another fire um, cropped up uh, over the hill in Napa, and it's Apparently, all the smoke is coming this way. So even in the studio, it's starting to get a little smoky. we got the molecules on full. They're, they're turned all the way up because it's just, it's just a messy, messy, messy. I, um, last time I did the show, I had that Microsoft Duo to play with. I just want to give you an update on that. It's going back. I loved the feeling of it. The, the hardware was very premium. It was really nice. 
Um, it just it wasn't. This, I think the I think there were a couple of problems. The software didn't really understand the dual screen, but I also think because they put a somewhat a slightly older processor in there, it just didn't feel very responsive or snappy. So, and I figured fifteen hundred dollars for a phone that's just not enough. So I thought, why don't I spend two thousand dollars and get a really nice, <laughs> nice phone? I, I feel like what I'm doing is a research project on alternate uh, form factors, but I, I'm 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 drawing the line at the LG Wing because that's just kooky. That's the one where the screen <laughs> flips yeah, sideways flips and there's a little hidden screen underneath. But this is the Galaxy uh, Z Fold 2, and uh, have any of you played with this yet? Because I have to say it's I've the reviews I read were very positive compared to the Duo, and I kind of agree. <laughs> Leo, I, I had one for a couple of weeks, did a review of it, and I um, and my wife loved it more than I did. I mean, she was sad to hear that it was going back. Yeah. But it's just, you know, the value for the dollar part. You can't uh, part justify of it. It's it. just not there. You no. can't justify. I went around Petaluma. It, and it's 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 so um, it's heavy. Uh, it doesn't. It looks elegant. It doesn't feel elegant. And. Um, uh, and I just, I, I don't think you can, at this point, you can justify the cost. It stuff. feels like a lopsided, poorly made sandwich because it's, it's, it's so thick. It's a sandwich where they left the meat out. Uh, and I was very concerned about the folding screen, although I have to say, having used it now, my concerns there are kind of alleviated. It actually works pretty well. It feels good. doesn't feel like plastic. And while you can see a crease if I angle it right, uh, when you're looking at it straight on, you really don't see it. It's really fun to take pictures with because it's 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 not as big as an iPad, but it's a big viewfinder. So it's kind of fun to do that with. But boy, was I nervous taking pictures because I thought, this is $2,000 if I drop it. And you know if you drop it, million pieces. Just <laughs> But the the main point, this is the thing, I've, I've not had one long enough to see if this would be valuable enough. But for that money, right, the, the main point of one of these things is, when I want a bigger, when I want more it. screen real pocket. estate, I have it. Yeah. Well, how often does that come up for you? Is it worth it? Does it come up enough that it, it's worth? No. Yeah. So I guess my thought would be this, you know, they talked a little bit about the, new, the second generation. Now they've made the front screen a little bit bigger. Right. It's still oddly narrow. You know, the aspect ratio is very tall and weird. Can so, you type on the, on the front, the front screen at all? Yeah, like but it's, it's really but it's like small. kind of cramped, right? Yeah, yeah, it's cramped. So you even if you don't need to open it up, you do want to open it up almost always. Then it's very feels very spacious, especially in contrast to the front screen. But then typing on this is weird. Now maybe this is just I haven't I have maybe not figured this out yet. But the it does a split screen, which I guess kind of makes sense as a, a split screen keyboard. Um, but I wish it would just take the whole bottom up. Because it this it this isn't any bigger. These are still small little keys because they because it's not using the whole thing. It's designed though for two hands, you know. It's yeah, but you know what else doesn't hand work on either side. Even though this is the Samsung keyboard, swipe doesn't work. It doesn't understand that there's a gap there. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't you can't. It's just I feel like there's this is like the same problem I had with the Duo. Essentially, was this is such a new form factor. Not everything works yet. Samsung's a lot closer. But no. you, no one should spend two thousand dollars on a phone that it, it, it is slippery and made of glass. This is but this is why insane. I thought the LG Wing design actually kind of made sense because you could you know rotate the screen up and then have on the bottom part you could have the keyboard and then you could type and you could still have that wider. I'm not saying it completely works, but at least like conceptually you could see the argument for it because you could sort of you know have the same typing experience you have on your phone right, right. now and have your real estate. Well, I, you know, I traded in the duo to get this. Maybe I'll trade this in. <laughs> get a, a wing. Keep it's going. Of, yeah, it's the Quest. Uh, also, the LG Wing uh, looks a lot like when you have it swapped over like the uh, hand terminals in the Expanse. <laughs> well, there is uh, something to be said for that, isn't there? That's right. That's the that's, that's right. what everybody. That's the end game, right? Everyone wants those Expanse things. The, the hand terminals, yes. <laughs> yeah. I guess, you know, in a way, uh, it would solve the keyboard problems I've had on these. Because that bottom screen, I presume, becomes a keyboard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe. I don't know. It's so goofy looking. I just, it's just, I can't. Uh, uh, it's not a dual screen. It's a, it's a T screen. It's just a weird, it's just weird to me. 
Well, it's the best of both worlds, Leo. <laughs> or the worst. I, <laughs> yeah. We are, I mean, clearly, uh, and we've said this before, we got an iPhone coming out next month. We are at peak phone. There's no way phones are going to, you have to go to these weird uh, form factors to do anything different these days. What do you think, Dwight? Is this, is it, is it, a, is it a fool's errand to try to reinvent the smartphone? Are we just perfect uh, now and you should just stop? Oh, no, no, I don't think it's perfect. And I think all these experiments are good because what will happen is there will be some technology, say, that comes out of the fold or out of the wing or uh, that will that will then be perfected by someone else. You know, Apple, for example, is working supposedly on a folding phone. It's playing around with it. And, you know, theirs will be thinner and, um, and you know, there'll be other there'll be things about it that they do with it. But whether that works, I don't know. What can so they? Uh, be, does Samsung own this folding screen technology? I mean, they make these screens. Are there others that could make can do this? I think Samsung has talked about selling it to other people, and and I see I vaguely okay. remember, and I'm not going to Google it right now, but I vaguely remember there was some discussion of Apple acquiring some folding screens from Samsung. But then it's going to be the same screen, so it's really going to come down to whether the software can be. And here's right. the good thing. Unlike Samsung, Apple controls both the hardware and the software completely. So they don't, they're not, you know, they don't have to make it work on Android. So it presumably would work better. I don't know. I don't but know. I don't know. I think that the way technology develops is that people try some outrageous things and other people look at it and go, well, let's, let's use that with this. Right. And then it works. You know? Right. But I think, so I think we need this experiment. Well, that's you know the case with the. I my guess is that Apple might say be experimenting with it, but is waiting for glasses, and that they think that the. I would guess their thought is, and I'd be curious what you think about this, Peter, that the new form factor is not doing more with a single phone, but having glasses, AirPods, watch, yeah, that extend the phone, but the phone stays fundamentally the same. It's the computer in your pocket. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, you can see that that's Apple's strategy, which is, in, in a way, it kind of mirrors the original strategy that Steve Jobs laid out for the PC as the hub I for was just gonna all say these that. devices. Yeah, and so it goes back right. to, I think, 18 years ago or so. So now the phone becomes the hub, yeah, and for a lot of reasons. One is you can put a more powerful processor in there. You can put a bigger battery. You can put the you know 5G radio in there. It's going to be hard to pack that stuff into the glasses. It's going to be hard to pack that stuff into AirPods. You know, you can sort of do it in the watch, whether you can get 5G in a watch anytime soon remains to be seen, right? Uh, but the idea that like you're having this network of devices that all work together and the phone is at the center of them, um, that appears to be Apple's strategy. And I think that one advantage that it gives for Apple is it actually makes it harder for people to leave the iPhone. Absolutely. Because all of a sudden you yes. have, you know, you got to replace yes. your watch, you got to replace your glasses, you got to replace, you know, your, 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 uh, your wireless headphones. And so, you know, the more that they can create this ecosystem of devices that all work really, really well together, the harder it is to leave because you got to swap out not just one thing now but like four maybe even five it works in both it both ways yeah and yeah. they want to lock you in for sure yeah. so yeah i think that makes more sense than trying to make a phone that can do uh do everything especially since <clears throat> it's pretty clear we've hit the limits on what people are willing to pay for a pocket device i mean 2000 is way too much 1500 people were bitching about the duo being 1500 i think a thousand is the sweet spot you know it's hard to charge a lot more than that yeah, Samsung was charging fifteen hundred for the Flip Z. You know their right. their uh, vertical folding phone. And that, you know, that that was too much for that that particular form factor. I'm just nervous See? as hell carrying this around. I ought to have it chained to my wrist. Like <laughs> well, they make a case for that. I ordered case the case. It's not out for two weeks, so I got. I'm <laughs> oh, I'm in two weeks of fear. Flying through the danger zone <laughs> with my uh, Samsung folding phone. Uh, I, I feel the need to fold. Um, all right, let's take a little break. I want to come back. Uh, the reason I want to take a break so early in the show is because we need to check if TikTok still works. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand the president's having a, a press conference, so maybe I don't know what's going on. But welcome to 2020. Uh, this was supposedly, right, a deadline day. I don't know what's going on. Then there's court cases just a mess. We'll get an update on that. Um, we could, I guess, talk about the Apple Watch. I have the Series 6 here. I just washed my hands. It scolded me. That's no fun. We could talk about a big birthday. How old do you think Google is? 
No peeking. Oh, I already knew. You knew. 22. <laughs> 22. Yeah. yeah. Can you believe it's that old? Of course, my son's 26, yes. so I guess I can, yeah. It just feels like... Uh, I miss... I miss Alta Vista. <laughs> no one even misses Alta Vista. No I, Alta Vista was pretty good at the time, though. It was for, for its time. time right. For its time. I got, yeah. you know, if you like Alta Vista, try Duck, Duck, Go. It's, you know, it's equally bizarre. <laughs> uh, our show today, I keep trying Duck, Duck, Go because I, I really want to like it. But it's basically just Bing. And I'm sorry, I can't. I just can't. Our show today brought to you by LastPass. We got a big event coming up uh, with LastPass. We're going to have uh, uh, a lot of fun uh, talking about security. What we're going to do is we're going to do teams. It's going to be a team event. We've done a number of events with LastPass. October is security month. October 8th, 1 p.m. Pacific, we're going to do red team versus blue team. We're going to have hackers versus defenders. And we've got a really good lineup for this, including... Uh, Log me in CISO, Gerald Buchelt, who's been on all of our events. He'll be joined by, uh, I think we're going to make Robert Balasair an attacker. Brian Chi from This Week in Enterprise Tech, an attacker. And then we'll have Jerry, uh, who's a CISO, and uh, the great security guru, Bruce Schneier, as defenders. I haven't decided yet who's going to be on what team. But we'll talk about common attack scenarios and the best way to defend against them. This is going to be not just fun, but I think very um, educational. It'll be almost like a debate format. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we're doing that with uh, LastPass October 8th at 1 p.m. We're big fans of LastPass, not just because they bought the studio naming rights. In fact, I've been a fan for almost as long as I've been doing these shows. LastPass came out about 12 years ago, something like that. And I started using it immediately to keep track of all my passwords. Actually, it went well beyond that almost immediately because it's so secure, because the encryption is done perfectly so that you only are decrypted on device. You never are decrypted anywhere else. Your password is never transmitted to LastPass. So I really trust it. It's become kind of a software secure enclave on all my devices. So I don't just put passwords and logins there. I put everything there, my, my driver's license, my passport. When I traveled, haven't done that in a while, but when I traveled, uh, you, you know, you always want to bring a copy of your passport. Perfect place to store it in LastPass. I always have it on me. It's always safe, but it's also secure from prying eyes. When it comes to business, there is nothing more important than that identity and access management that LastPass provides. They actually surveyed uh, 700 IT and security professionals in financial services and IT and retail and a bunch of different industries. Almost all of them said their business has been exposed to risk due to poor identity and access management. 82% said that. That's why you need LastPass. The risks are out there. As we work from home, our employees are, you know, outside of the shelter of the, of the workplace. They are vulnerable. They, uh, you don't want them sharing passwords with one another via text messages or email. That's why you have LastPass. They may have a secure and safe way to share passwords. They, you, the, of course, employees get that same strong, secure password storage for storing every app and web login they use. And, of course, with single sign-on and all of LastPass, your IT always has absolute insight into who is accessing what and where. Over, oversight of shadow IT, enforceable policies across all password-protected accounts, that's LastPass. That's what LastPass is all about. And they also have added, by the way, of course, we love two-factor, and LastPass supports that. But in the enterprise, they now have added multi-factor, contextual factors like geolocation and IP address so that you really know that the, the right people are accessing your most valuable resources, your web logins, your, your QuickBooks, your data, your customer records. You've got to keep that stuff safe. AES 256-bit encryption, PBKDF2 to make it hard to brute force, complete security in the cloud. That's why I trust LastPass. Why you should trust LastPass. That's why we've been using LastPass in the enterprise for many years now. Thank goodness we've got it. It's the number one password manager. Let LastPass securely manage your user's identity by letting your employees work efficiently without making your business vulnerable to cyber threats. LastPass.com slash twit. LastPass.com slash twit. Because stronger security cannot wait. Uh, I don't even know where to start with this. <laughs> every every episode, it seems like there's something new with TikTok. 
Um, <laughs> TikTok, of course, went to court. They said, you can't ban us. <laughs> you can't ban us. Uh, the DOJ went back to court saying uh, they ruled against uh, three uh, users defending the ban in TikTok against a Pennsylvania judge's ruling Saturday, or citing the Pennsylvania judge's ruling Saturday against against three TikTok users. Um, TikTok users who requested that the plan be denied. The judge denied that. So uh, the DOJ pounced on it. Uh, I thought that today there was a... Brian, how do you cover the news daily? How, yeah. do, how do you even cover this story? Do you know what I, I said this week? I, I was like, listen, I'm going to throw my hands up in the air. Yes. <laughs> every, after every segment. So here's, here's what I can tell you. First of all, at this moment... Whatever that press conference is, they're asking him questions about who's playing Biden in the debate. So whether we're going to oh, find out Lord. while we're having this conversation, <laughs> what his decision is, I don't know. Oh, Lord. Um, the, so By the way, the, who is playing Biden in the debate? Oh, I didn't see if anyone knew the answer. To that. <laughs> I just assumed Maybe he wasn't practicing at all. Yeah, that's what he said. He said, I practice every day. Oh uh, no! I, right, I, I I agree with. Uh, I thought he wasn't uh, practicing right. at all because he he didn't. Th right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so here's here's what we <laughs> here's what we know. Number one, um, the deal should, in theory, be um, uh, uh, Oracle and Walmart take a percentage. The problem yeah. is the president is saying the percentage is a hundred percent. The TikTok. Oh, he is doesn't saying know. At the percentage is 20%. Yeah. Not only that, apparently the reporting has been that there's not even a term sheet. Like, oh, Lord. Typically, so everyone, the agreement as it exists has always been an agreement in principle. And so when things get floated like this $5 billion fund that the president believes is going to go to education and things like this. Um, apparently that's nowhere near the term sheet. Cause again, the term sheet doesn't exist on top of that. If it does exist, it would come after the IPO that would happen if the deal goes through, well, the, which, so which would pay for the $5 billion reeducation fund. The president's demanding. Right. right. Uh, but, or would come out of um, payroll taxes and things like that. <laughs> so it's one of those things where I keep saying something's probably going to happen because I feel like there would be a situation where everyone can declare victory and nothing actually functionally changed except Oracle maybe got a kind of sweetheart deal out of it. Um, but – the, I, I, I would have thought that that would have happened by now. And the fact that it hasn't makes me think that it's, it's never going to happen. And yeah. then here's the bottom line. No matter what happens, if if Trump right now as we're speaking says, yeah, I accept the 20 percent deal or whatever, or no, I insist on the, whatever. If they iron that out in the end, the Chinese can still say, nah. Right. Yeah, the Chinese I mean, government I mean, they're the ones has the ultimate veto. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And they have said they will say no. <laughs> right. To the current deal. Well, they, yeah. They've okay. looked at that and said. You know, we're so, not going to sign off on this. So, um, the, and then the, there's the federal court <laughs> right hearing, which is happening today. today it happened. Ruling yeah. tonight. Yeah. That you know where he will say whether he blocks the ban or lets it go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Commerce but, 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 Department wait, but, but, ban on the App Store was supposed to happen at noon Eastern today. I don't think that did. So I think we're waiting now, for think this about, judge. There's one more wrinkle to this in terms of things. It all being Kabuki theater. So let's say that. He announces right now that the app has to come out of the App Store and Google Play, that they can't functionally remove um, the app from anyone's phones. So then the real teeth would be is if no one can do any hosting like that Cepheus or I never know how to pronounce that or whatever. The, you know, the, the committee thing that says on you foreign investment in the United right. States. You but that's foreign investment in U.S. companies, not U.S. investment in foreign companies. But it's like it's like a sanction. So but the they can key, say you can't yeah. you can't access your right. bank account. They, they can't say no financial transactions. Well, if you can't do business with them, then AWS would have to say we can no right. longer host you or right. something. Right? That would kill it. Um, there is. Don't tell the president. Just keep this under your hat. But both Apple and Google have a kill switch. Right, they can they can pull apps from your phone. I think they've done it. It seems to me they can kill malicious yes. apps. Yeah, yeah. So just don't tell the president. But apparently they could if they wanted to. You, TikTok could disappear from your phone. Here's here's the only thing I would say. We've covered this, and I've done the same thing, Brian. Throw your hands up. 
which is the, also coincidentally the same thing you do on a roller coaster, uh, throw your hands up and say, I don't know what the hell's going to go on. Here's what I would say. Our relationship with China is complex. It is geopolitically and strategically extremely complex. They own a lot of assets in the United States, including treasury bonds. Uh, most U.S. tech companies manufacture their gear in China, made in many cases with parts made in China. China is an interesting country. They're treating their Uyghur Muslims um, very badly in internment camps and slave labor. Uh, they have definite economic aspirations around the world with their Belt and Road Initiative. They're, they're reaching out, much as the United States has done with foreign aid for years, uh, to, uh, to countries and saying, let us help you to co-opt them a little bit. Um, there's intellectual property rights issues with China. But this is a very big, complicated issue that requires strategic planning, diplomacy, thoughtfulness, subtlety, negotiation, banning... Forethought. Forethought. Banning an app is not <laughs> in any way useful to this process. Do we agree or... Who wants to who wants to say TikTok should be banned? Because we've had a lot of people on this panel. I don't have it on my phone anymore. Neither I don't have any more than I have Facebook on my phone. But that's a personal choice, and certainly the Department of Defense has the absolute right and probably burden to say no military personnel should have TikTok on their phone. I would hope they do okay. the same with Facebook. One more angle for this being Kabuki theater is that Microsoft, <laughs> like chumps made the mistake of negotiating in good faith and saying, oh, man. okay, is security yeah. your issue? Well, our deal, let us have it. We will solve all of your security issues. So one of the most frustrating things to me it has been, if that was really what the concern was, then it should have been Microsoft. But apparently, um, Larry Ellison has held fundraisers for Trump. Right. So It looks like cronyism, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, it, looks I, looks like, like, NBC, it looks like I talked it looks about like revenge. Oh, sorry, Dwight. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, uh, please, Peter. Yeah, well, I was on CNBC a couple weeks ago to talk about TikTok, and and when I pointed out the potential corruption in all of this, um, you, I started getting death threats immediately. Well, that's uh, you know everybody, and this is something it's a very people, emotional topic. People don't you know. talk about. Uh, everybody's walking on eggshells here because there are armed people <laughs> out there who will on either side. Maybe I don't know if there's are TikTokers armed. Probably not. Probably not. They're, they're armed with Tide Pods, but they're not armed with guns. But there are people out there who will enforce uh, this stuff by force. And so everybody's a little bit nervous. I'm more scared, frankly, of of the president's uh, supporters than I am of China at this point. So I don't. I really don't know um, if there's anything more to say about this. We're just going to watch and throw well, up our hands. <laughs> I, have, I, my, I I'll make one last point. Please um, do. But but it's that if there are look there are legitimate concerns about data and you know TikTok's relationship to the Chinese Communist Party and and you know what happens to to user data. I think that those concerns need to be addressed at an industry level via regulation, right? A set of rules that everybody Chinese yes. American companies all have to adhere because to. it's not just TikTok; it's also Facebook. It's also everybody. absolutely, yeah. And the, and the reality is that if you know if somebody wants to get data from TikTok users or Facebook users or whatever platform, you can usually get that through some sort of third party data broker, uh, and that is an extremely you know a very lightly regulated market right now. Um, you know, I, I think that people, the average person, might be very surprised to find out how much data about themselves uh, is floating out there, and I think. You know, we with the CCPA, there has been an attempt to sort of address and mitigate that. But very, very few people are taking advantage of, you know, their rights to be able to uh, have their private data deleted. And I think partly an awareness issue. And I think partly people, um, you know, uh, uh, don't feel especially threatened about that sort of data versus, you know, their DMs being exposed. And then there's Palantir, which has its IPO on uh, Tuesday. They're seen opening about $10 a share. This is a U.S. company run, uh, big investor is Peter Thiel, uh, run by um, Alex, oh, I forget, Carp, um, that 
seems to be doing all sorts of data mining on data gathered by U.S. intelligence and arm and uh, police officials, and then resold back to police officials. Things like you know pre-crime reports. I mean, we're, we're <laughs> China is not the sole owner of these kinds of technologies. We're we're very actively participating in this. Uh, you got you got your uh, you got your bid in for your Palantir stock there, Peter. You're you're gonna stock up? No, in fact, I I actually don't. Um, uh, I don't try to play the stock market game no. at all. That's I mean, I own foolish, some public stocks, but it's managed. Foolish game. Yeah. I, given I, um, how given how old Palantir is as a company, and they've never horrible. made penny one, by the way. They're not there, and their revenue growth is not as it, it's kind of now. What could happen, given the recent stock market stuff, is all the kids on Robinhood could shoot this thing to the moon. But, um, you know, it, they're, <laughs> that's, they're, another, numbers that's a that story, impressive. too. I love that. We should probably go into the Robinhood story <laughs> at some point. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to inter interrupt you, but you, oh, no, that's a that. good point. It, it's, that's why the stock under, market's under, so unpredictable. Under yeah. normal circumstances, this would be a sort of, eh, I, I wouldn't put my money in that. But then at the same time, you know, uh, you know, there were different – Snowflake was a different case because if you got Warren Buffett making his first tech IPO investment ever, like that would do something. But it is – so much of the stuff has been this momentum trading with um, – they always say that the young people on, on Robinhood, but, you know, whatever. If, if anyone on Robinhood, it's like it's back to the day traders of the late 90s. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't. Uh, so there's there's two areas that we prob we probably don't have the um, expertise, the tech experts to delve into. One is politics. The other is the stock market. So <laughs> so I won't I won't move on. Both seem incomplete at this time anyway. Completely incomprehensible. Uh, I'm I'm just watching to see uh, what happens uh, both to WeChat and uh, TikTok. Um, we'll see what, if the judge's ruling comes in, which it should, I think, before the end of the show. Um, it was it was supposed to come in sometime before midnight, is what. Was, oh. Is what said, so it okay, be so it could not be. It could be. Yeah, it was the deadline in the middle of the night. Okay. We just got to keep going, Leo, until we get an answer. We're not going to end this show <laughs> until the judge tells us what's happening to TikTok. That's all there is. <sighs> okay. Let's see. I'm just looking at. This is this has been a complex week. What do you, Brian? You know, it used to be there were rhythms in tech news, and you know that we like next week the new Pixel phone is going to come yeah. out, and you know, a couple of weeks ago Apple had their event. And it was just these kind of rhythms. You know what you'd be covering. Now it feels like whiplash. It feels like well, you know, bumper cars. And, and this, it, I've only been doing it daily for three years, but the summer was usually reliably slow. Yeah, and you would think no. the summer of COVID, it would be slow, and it hasn't been. And I don't know. Why. I was, I was, when COVID hit and we all went into quarantine, I was thought, oh, well, that's it on that. <laughs> we're going to be, we're going to be talking about baseball for half the shows or something. Uh, as it turns out, we're not talking about baseball. There's a lot of tech. But then news. also, I mean, it's not helpful. This is totally inside baseball. But when uh, when Amazon has a hardware event announcing, I don't know, 42 different products, <laughs> and they don't stream it, and they don't give you embargoed heads up on what they're I announcing. Know. And it's just. Funny. I know. I woke up on uh, Thursday, went, what? <laughs> let's do that. Actually, let's do the Amazon. Let's do the Amazon event because yeah. this will this is the gift that we'll be giving, keep on giving for some time to come. Uh, I ordered uh, that weird wristband. They announced this a few uh, like a month or two ago that will do uh, um, emotional temperature assessments on you based on your voice. Because <laughs> I really want to know if I'm yelling at my subordinates too often, right? I think <laughs> or not enough. Or not or not enough. <laughs> Leo, you're too nice. You're too nice. You should be more mean. That would be funny if it said that. Somehow I don't think it's going to do. Uh, they announced some very dystopian sci-fi weirdo stuff. Uh, let's, let's start by talking about Amazon's Sidewalk, a mesh network designed to extend Amazon's reach into your whole neighborhood. They already, you know, they acquired Ring and they're already getting heat for the fact that Ring cameras are everywhere recording everything that happens in your neighborhood and sending it off to the police. Now they want to do sidewalk. Dwight, have you have you been, can you explain sidewalk to me? 
No, Sidewalk. In fact, this is the first time that I've heard Amazon Sidewalk. When you said Sidewalk, I thought Microsoft Google Sidewalk. Google Sidewalk. Yeah. Google Sidewalk. Yeah, actually, but every major tech company I've has a Sidewalk except for Apple. I'm waiting for Apple's Sidewalk. <laughs> Google has Sidewalk, which is their smart city initiative. Microsoft had Sidewalk, which was their local news. Right. Now, now Amazon Sidewalk, which is a shared network, a mesh-style network that that helps to – this is – I'm reading Amazon's copy – helps devices – like Amazon Echo, Ring security cameras, outdoor lights, and motion sensors work better beyond your Wi-Fi. And one of the first things they announced is a sensor you put on your mailbox. Many of us who live uh, in more rural areas have mailboxes that are somewhat distant from our uh, door. It will let you know if the mail has arrived. <laughs> but it will also uh, ex expand the reach of the Amazon network out to the street, and they're hoping that everybody who has a ring doorbell and this, this will be make this kind of this mesh coverage over the whole uh, neighborhood. They should have called this Amazon Nope. Yeah, because, <laughs> because no, that's to just be, that's. All right, you're going to say how not, great this is. No, I'm not. I'm going to be devil's advocate in the sense that it's low bandwidth. I I described yeah. it as this is. They're trying to build the internet for the internet of things. You know, the the use case that they love to tout is that if you have a tracker on your your dog or your pet or whatever, um, it right. would as be it able walks to down the it. street, each mailbox exactly. goes, "I see him, I see him, I see him." But the point is, is that it is super low bandwidth. Like you wouldn't even notice it if you join the mesh because it's it's connecting to the lights and the ring right. camera and the whatever, whatever. It's they not say, that you're going to walk down the street and have Wi-Fi ever. Oh, God, no, no, no. In fact, this isn't going to be accessible to you. This isn't for you. This is for the machines. 80 kilobits, not very fast. Although I remember having a 56 kilobit modem. It's fast, faster than that. Uh, 80 kilobits, and it's capped at 500 megabytes a month. Again, eh, you know, that's 10 minutes of streaming video a month. I think this, the trick is going to be to persuade people to participate in this. Well, Will, that's the thing is that it isn't useful unless everybody does it. Right. What if happens? It's a snaggletooth it, network, then it's It's nothing. a snaggletooth network. That's, ex that's a good name for it. <laughs> Better than sidewalk. What happens in the FAQ? What happens if there are not a lot of bridges in my neighborhood? Amazon sidewalk coverage may vary by location based on the number of participating bridges in the location. The more of your neighbors who participate, the better. To be, you know. Yeah. I stop. I so actually are traded like, in. Are they going to be like parties, like Amazon yeah. Sidewalk, yeah, sidewalk parties, parties. where? You, you invite your friends over and try to sell them on installing this stuff. This just sounds What's awful. This really brings to a head I, this I whole... It doesn't sound that crazy to me. Yeah. So that's I, what I, I mean. Kinda... This brings together... <laughs> no, it brings to about, a head... Think about how it is practically. You know, so for example, if you're in Houston and you've got these houses that are each on a quarter acre yeah. lot yeah. and there's 700 of them in a neighborhood and maybe a third of them have it, and they're distant from each other. It's worthless. You gotta have the only way it works. Yeah, is yeah. No, I mean it has I, wider I, coverage in the suburbs, and if it has, um, and if it's got strong, but if it's got better coverage. If you have an echo, a, a modern echo device or a ring camera or a ring spotlight, they are all bridges. Now I imagine there'll be a switch turn it on or off. The question is, it will yeah. the default be on? Uh, I traded in my ring doorbell because of this whole given the video to the cops thing made me very nervous. I got a Google a Google Hello doorbell, which has its own problems. It recognizes people. It says, John's at the door. You want to say hi? It's like, what? So, in fact, it even says, it even has a warning when you set it up, this may not be legal in all states. So consult your, <laughs> consult your local laws because uh, it has face recognition in it. Well, Leo, we, we uh, listen. Not to push things along too quickly, but then we've got to get to the the drone sentinel inside your. Oh, house. we're going to get to it. Don't worry. There's plenty <laughs> more. There's. We're just beginning. We're just beginning with this the wildest Amazon event ever, and they have had wild events. Uh, this is the what. What I was going to say is this epitomizes the tension between privacy and convenience. 
And, and, and I think that that's going to be the story of the next five years of technology is, hey, this is really great. You know, your dog will know where your dog is. We'll know when you got some mail. I'm sure there'll be other applications beyond that. There's some fairly trivial. Uh, and yeah, you give up a little privacy. So, you know, it's not that bad. Peter, Peter you, you seem like you were all in on this. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm all in, but I think that, you know, the, I think that we have to separate out the parts that make us uncomfortable and the parts that make us uncomfortable. I mean, the fact that there's a mesh network where data is repeating across multiple users like this, um, I don't think that is inherently problematic. The data is almost certainly going to be, you know, encrypted anyway. And so it's not like you're going to have access to, you know, your neighbor's data as it passes through. No. And your, even if you, know, you did, you'd know when your when your their, their mail arrived or something. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be that. Yeah. It's more like, you know, do we want to give, Amazon, for example, or any big company, you know, this level of granular yes. data over. But like, you know, I think the reality is we have given up a lot of this stuff. And again, to go back to the point around TikTok, I think that, you know, the only real solve for this is at a regulatory level. I mean, it's not a pop necessarily the most popular solution um, or the easiest solution, but I think that it is the one that would be the most effective is you have to set rules of the road for all these big companies about how they have to treat, you know, customer data uh, and protect it. Um, and I think without that, you know, one, you have this sort of race to the bottom, right? Where, um, you know, one company might sort of might decide, hey, we're going to take these protections. And if their competitor doesn't, then they're at a disadvantage in some respects. Your this the premise, though, requires a functional government. Well, a lot of things require a functional government. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just saying, I mean, that seems like a high bar at this point. Not just I'm not talking about I'm not talking about Trump. I'm just saying. In general, expecting sensible privacy regulation. I guess California did a decent job. So maybe that's not the case. I just it's feel like it's not impossible, yeah. um, but it is hard. But I mean, you could say this about everything that we have regulation. It's all hard. Right? I mean, whether yeah. it's food or transportation or um, look, I mean, it wasn't popular to put seatbelts in cars. Right. right. Um, and, but it was and, a good thing. Talk, yeah. Yep. And people talked about it violating their freedom yep. and, you know, the seatbelt yep. laws and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, there are certain things that happen in the public interest and those things have to be solved at that level. I mean, you know, they can't be, they're not things that individuals can solve on their own and they're not business, they're not things that businesses have the right incentive to solve or address. So I guess the question one should ask, absent government regulation <laughs> someday, uh, is why is Amazon doing this? Like, I don't think there's a, I don't think people have been pounding on Jeff Bezos's door saying, I need a mailbox sensor. Why is Amazon doing this? Now, I'm going to take a hazard to guess. You can tell me if I'm wrong. Amazon is driving a lot of trucks around all the time. I think Amazon would love this mesh network to locate their deliveries and to, and to, this is your, I think you're offering your bandwidth to help Amazon be better in logistics. You're also Possibly you're also building their logistics vehicle. stack. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, uh, that, Brian. And then I I'll, mean, okay. you've got you've got the camera at your front door. Uh, you've got the sensors. So, like, you know, if you, you know, the, the the Amazon people delivering to our house now, you know, you see them take the picture. That yeah, they, I love you know, that. Deliver, right. Yeah. Um, I so, even get right. a notice. They so, say they're nine stops away. They're eight stops away. They're six stops right. away. Which well, is, so maybe the this is and honestly, what's scary about this is this is the best case scenario. Maybe the best case scenario is that Amazon is convincing all of us to buy and build out the logis the the stack that they need to to make their logistics simpler. They say things in the Amazon blog post like, "Just imagine, uh, we're going to do a proof of concept with the American Red Cross." Just imagine if Sidewalk could support the tracking of blood collection supplies between distribution centers and donation sites to add new efficiencies within the blood donation supply chain. That sounds like they really had to dig deep to find a public service use case, <laughs> use case for this. Yeah, that's like they, they could already do that without yeah. uh, Amazon Sidewalk. Yeah. No, this has more to do with Amazon's logistics, I suspect. But I also think that there is a larger question of, do we want this private company to set up a mesh network, kind of ad hoc mesh network over our communities? Like, is that something a company should really be doing? No. Well, it's, sort of, it's an ISP question at some level, right? I mean, should we have publicly funded or publicly created 
ISPs. And, um, you know, the fact that a lot of states are now passing regulation laws banning uh, municipal ISPs. That's um, shocking. That's so sad. Yeah. But, you know, you can imagine a a city saying, hey, we're going to set up one of these low bandwidth mesh networks um, on public infrastructure. We're going to cover the entire city and we're going to open it up, you know, to any provider uh, and we'll charge for access. Uh, And it could be, you know, one, I mean, it require a lot of upfront investment, but over the long run, it could be a public benefit for, you know, the population, but also a potential source of revenue for the city. And so, you know, these are, these are things that, again, you know, requires people thinking ahead and and willing to make the investment. Um, And that's really tough. And that's why a lot of this stuff ends up being done by private companies that have the resources to do it. I feel like also not to, not to put you down, Peter, because I'm so glad you're here and you really add a (laughs) <laughs> uh, good, but I feel like it's a little bit of a cop out to say, "Oh well, the government should regulate this." Like I'm a, not saying the, gov- the government well, no, whoever no, no, would no. or do it right, and b, like there should it also couldn't we just stand up and say no? Just don't no buy to, it. No, don't no buy to what? It. No, no, well, yeah, no don't to buy it if you don't like. But don't my neighbors it. might. And that's the problem. I don't have any. You know, I guess that's How's where government. Good, but, well, <laughs> but I we mean, could raise. Here's the thing. This I look at this and I go. This is this is the camel's nose under the tent, and nobody's even like it's not on. Nobody's even mentioning it. Amazon is proposing putting up a mesh network over all of our communities that they will control. They will reap the data from and decide what the data is, and they and the and the and the 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 offer that they're making is well. You now and you'll know if your mailbox has been opened. Is so bizarre. Your dog will be tracked. It's so it's so inconsequential and nobody's saying golly this this is an interesting invasion uh that amazon you know a soft invasion that amazon is perpetrating and nobody's paying any attention to it or am i i my friend jeff jarvis on this week in google constantly spanks me for moral panic so maybe this is moral panic i just feel like this is an odd play from amazon's point of view there's not enough questions being asked yeah. about this and I also think Amazon is taking advantage of a loose regulatory environment right now. They've been working on this for a year, but it's time. I think they wanted to announce this before the election because their environment is pretty loose right now. And you can kind of start this thing ball rolling. And especially in the fact, in light of the fact that they are getting, they got so much heat for Ring. And then they got heat because they were listening in on Echo uh, recordings. So they were already kind of, and then the government's already, you know, Jeff Bezos got more questions from Congress than anybody uh, at the antitrust hearings. I, I feel like they're saying, you know, you better get this sidewalk thing going now. I've I've asked several people over the last year when I've interviewed them, doesn't it feel like Amazon has gotten weirdly aggressive lately? Yes. <laughs> like, the, like is, I, I've asked people, like, point blank, has there been, like, an executive turnover? Are there new people in there? Are there cowboys that came in or something? But, like, even Ring was, you know, a reasonable, successful startup, but it wasn't blowing the doors off anybody. And ever since Amazon acquired them, like they've become almost the ring company. Like you never saw Google double down this hard on Nest and things like that. Like like Amazon has done with Ring. I, I feel like half the products they announced were ring related products. Yeah. So it's all about look to to your point, they seem to see that there it's the field is wide open to grab the home and grab the public space in terms of if we're talking about data and the the value of data and so maybe you're right maybe they're trying to Indiana Jones style get get out before the the door slams shut Google's own sidewalk project was kicked out of Toronto because uh, the community said we don't uh, we don't like the idea of Google having a smart neighborhood this is so, like so i would i would love to hear from the guys at Wise, you know, Wise is that low-cost Internet of Things uh, mm-hmm. s- a company that's a bunch of guys from Amazon left, and they're selling, uh, you know, security cameras for inside and outside the home for twenty-five bucks. They weren't good enough. They just introduced uh, a doorbell, and they're adding more and more stuff. I would really love to hear from them about what they think about what Amazon is doing. And, uh, and what they think about both the security issues as well as the privacy issues. We haven't talked about security. What happens if this network, if uh, hackers get into this network, if it's breached? Well, does it breach the whole neighborhood? It is in a Wi... Oh, that's interesting. I mean, it's not a Wi-Fi network. It's, a, it's, it's kind of like Zigbee or Z-Wave. It's a low bandwidth IoT network, probably not carrying a huge amount of 
information. No, what does it give you entree to? Yeah, you but know, does it get you into that? Because it, you, you well, know, it right. is but, the bridge but, but isn't I mean, as, uh, most of these Ring devices as well as your Echo devices. But I mean, I mean, we could say, you know, uh, what if someone hacks into you right. know, Comcast You're, in your neighborhood? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's there's it's, plenty of ways to get in that. Yeah, there's no that's not an issue. I, I, just, I just think this. I, I think let's 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 put this in its proper context. It just seems like a strange grab. All right, I'm just. I don't think it's like I don't think it's a strange grab. I mean, I think like again, Amazon is trying to quantify the physical world um, right. because at the end of the day, they are a logistics company, and so right. this is a you know there is an opportunity. And if frankly, you know, if this is going to be something that happens, it's better from Amazon's perspective for people to standardize around you know sidewalk than if for it to be Google or Apple or not many other companies that could pull it off. But um, but it's better that better for it to be Amazon's mesh network than somebody else's. Somebody in the chat room, Shadow Shad XO, uh, says, "Well, Google and Facebook, you don't complain about them." I do, but the difference to me is this is kind of a, a watershed moment because uh, all these other companies are invading your privacy in the in the internet space. This is in meat space. This is them bridging over into the physical world uh, beyond your <laughs> your yeah. net. But Facebook's going to do that with the AR glasses. Yeah, everybody. I mean, you want to talk about something that's that's concerning? I'd say. You know, somebody with Facebook AR glasses walking around your house. Now Facebook has a model oh of your God. ear to your space. Oh my God! Um, and uh, you know, that's and certainly Amazon something that is going to compete because of their Sentry drone. Because right, Leo, please do. <laughs> All right, you really want to talk about the drone? I know you want to talk about the drone. So, just r real quickly, I, I do want to address the the, the AR glasses because that's an interesting point. A Facebook's probably doing the same thing by saying, hey, what if everybody wore a camera around for us? Wouldn't that be cool? So you're right, Peter. That's, you know, it's not that much different. That is, <laughs> that's going to be the, uh, let's say it, that's going to be the next kind of battleground is, is meat space. Like, okay, we got all the digital data we could possibly get. How do we get more meat space data? And that brings us to the drone, Hold on, hold on. Let's, I got, no. <laughs> no, you can say something. Go ahead. No, I'm just joking. I'm just, I'm just... <laughs> you just want to derail that conversation one more time. All right, I want to take a break before we get to the drone because I really want to torture Brian. <laughs> but I do, I agree. The drone is the silliest. It, but at the same time, the funny thing is, my wife says, let's get one. So I really, I, we got to talk about this because uh, uh, it's interesting. Our show today brought to you quite literally by Cashfly. That's our CDN, our content delivery network. Cashfly is really is one of the pioneers in this space. They've been innovating content delivery since the last century, the turn of the last century, 1999. We've been using them for more than 10 years. Remember when we first started Twit, we were begging people to seed the BitTorrent stream and, you know, we had to web download. We just, then Matt Levine called me from Cashfly and said, look, Leo, you need a CDN. You need Cashfly. And we have been happy Cashfly customers ever since. If you uh, if you never complain that it's hard to, you know, the podcast is slow to download, thank Cashfly. I never get a 3 a.m. call saying, oh, my God, the servers are down. Thank you, Cashfly. Cashfly also saves us a ton of money, will save you a ton of money with their new storage optimization system. So the one expense sometimes with a CDN is when you get a cache miss and you have to load the data from the source, Amazon S3 or wherever you keep your content. This could be a podcast, could be an application, could be a game, whatever the data, it could be video, streaming video. Those, those cache misses can end up costing you because, of course, it's much more costly to transmit the data across the Internet. This is what storage optimization system does for you. Cashfly is a dedicated storage space that's for you, where you put your data on the Cashfly network, it will save you potentially thousands a month by shielding your origin. And with zero cache misses, your download speeds will be drastically improved. No more buffering video. And you'll save money on your data transfer out fees. Because you're going to have a 100% cash hit ratio with Cashfly's SOS. Once you're a Cashfly customer, just decide how much storage you need. They'll take care of the rest. Cashfly is also really improving by adding new, there are points of presence all over the, the globe. That's why we like it, because we have listeners all over the globe. No matter where you're getting the show, you're getting it from a Cashfly server geographically proximate to you. That speeds up the downloads. 
It, it lowers the network traffic. It's really good all around. They've just added six new pops in South America. They actually are serving 10 times the amount of traffic in Latin America over the last year. We love that. We love our Latin American listeners. Cashfly has not only maintained but drastically improved the performance in Latin America and taken on a much higher traffic load. So that's the beauty of Cashfly. It doesn't matter where your end users are. North America, Latin America, the Caribbean, Europe, the Middle East, Asia Pacific. Cashfly delivers content quickly and reliably. In what you would normally think of as hard to reach regions, they're all local to you. That's what's great about Cashfly. Consistency and performance all over the world. Reliable throughput and scalability, five times faster than other CDNs. And because they have so many servers, they offer a 100% uptime SLA guarantee. So you get industry-leading global performance. You get a lower price than the other guys. You get 100% uptime. And you don't have these expensive cash misses. That's going to make a huge difference with video streaming, podcasting, digital downloads. They ensure cash misses are delivered five times faster than they would be from your origins, whether it's software delivery or games, video. Cashfly is also a great company. They just partnered with World Central Kitchen. They've donated over $50,000 to help serve 300,000 warm meals to people who are struggling. These are tough times. Cashfly is a great partner in the world. We're really happy to be partner with Matt and the Cashfly team. Let Cashfly's SOS save your ship. Just for Twit listeners, Cashfly is giving away a complimentary detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and usage trends. See if you're overpaying by 20% or more by going to twit.cashfly.com. Twit.cashfly.com. So <clears throat> I, my wife said no security cameras in the house. I understand that. She doesn't want, you know, stray video of her walking around on the Internet somewhere. She doesn't control it. I understand that. So, I, so when Amazon announced this new ring camera, I thought she'd say, absolutely not. She says, when are we getting one? <laughs> this is nuts. Brian, this is your story. Tell us about the ring always home cam. Well... I I actually want one too because I'm a nerd and I, it seems really cool. It is cool, but yeah. So imagine like a little box and a tiny drone can pop out of it, and <laughs> the the cameras on the the bottom part of it, like the little tail hanging down, so that when it's in its box, the camera's not looking. But the idea is, is it, it syncs to all the other ring stuff. And let's say there's a detection of a noise, maybe uh, somebody at the door or a window or no one should be in that room. Why is that light on? The, the, the drone pops up and flies over and with its camera investigates. And I, I imagine that the use case is, is you would get a notification on your phone and you open up the app and you can watch in real time the, the video, et cetera, et cetera. So let me give you the first thing that is blowing my mind about this, and then please, please come back for the second one. The the first thing is that um, it, it's going to map your home. It's going to map the interior space of your home. And uh, so, you know, by the way, my Roomba does that as well in order to clean sure. my floors. And, and sure. yeah. However, Roomba doesn't also have a side business of selling me things. <laughs> and so the first thing is, is we don't know yet because this isn't available. They just announced it. It's not 250 uh, bucks we don't know what, sometime next year, sometime next year. But we crucially, we don't know the terms of service yet. So um, are they allowed to do anything with it? Like if they go by your pantry and they see, you know, what oh, brands you of should order crackers some more, you some more Charmin, you need more Charmin. I was or, just no, in the more, master more bath. That. And you're, your you're toilet paper's family low. As opposed to uh, well, whatever right. family. That's right, right, right. That's right. So that's number one. And that gets back to, and, and I'll leave it here so we can come back to number two later. But it, it, that gets back to your conversation about what sort of privacy are you giving up? What sort of data are you giving up? Because now they are going inside. Your home is a castle. Your hearth, the, you know, going back to the Magna Carta. This is the, where the already, law can't. 
have a Google Nest cam and a Facebook portal. But but <laughs> the point is, is that you have set up those cameras at specific places that you have oh, designated. Right. I, I understand But the drone that doesn't go on its own. You you So it does say when you get the drone, but it you will map your to, home. It has to map your home in yeah. order to not run into things, yeah. right? So at the very least, and then part two will be the law enforcement part of this, but at the very least, Somewhere, you know, on a server somewhere, they will have an interior map of your home and we don't know what they can do with the video of it. Like, well, they put the couch over here. They put the what What would they do with? Well, the TV is on in these hours with, you know, Amazon right. T Prime TV. Well, it what doesn't would they do go, with the fact it, that it doesn't come out when it doesn't come all the out time. Right, 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 when right. you're home, I hope. <laughs> but it would, then my it, wife wouldn't want idea, this. The whole idea right. is. And, you know, they mention things like, do you ever leave the stove on? You want to know? Ask the drone. Did I leave the garage door open? Ask the drone. Where's the dog right now? Ask the drone. Apparently the drone is very loud. On purpose. Yeah. Well, also because they probably couldn't help it. <laughs> well, but, the, uh, but right, they couldn't help it. Drones but they, are noisy. They make the point of saying, "Oh, we're we're so you don't you won't, it won't be sneak up. It no won't sneak up. Yeah, sneak up. Yeah. On yeah. On yeah. yeah. Um, the IEEE spectrum <laughs> was the most critical of this of all of the stories. They say why you should be very skeptical of Ring's indoor security drone. They interviewed, uh, among other people, they interviewed a uh, a number of privacy uh, experts, a professor. Um, who said? Let me see if I can find it here. Oh, I just, I just went by the uh, the quote that I was going to read to you. Ryan Kalo is a professor at the University of Washington School of Law. Said fixed cameras can be avoided. Right, they're little light on them. I see my Nest cam right there. It's it's glowing. Fixed cameras can be avoided. Mobile ones can't, which makes it impossible for a child, spouse, or roommate to get away from the camera. Oh, I hadn't thought imagine, about that. Imagine the domestic violence yeah. uh, issues yeah. involved there. So could a, could a husband who's suspicious of his wife leave the house, then turn on the drone and see what's going on? Well, or say, I told you never to leave this room. Oh, God. Uh, he says, the professor says, if mobile surveillance is normalized, my concern is it will permit an ab abuser to check in on their partner wherever they are erase surveillance blind spots, and remove excuses that the surveilled individual is merely off camera. Surveillance is a well-known component of domestic abuse. Well, that's a very good point. Um, okay, let me get to point two real quick, and then I promise I will, I will shut no, up. No, no, this is your story. You, you love this story. I love it. That's good. Part two is that, remember, Ring has gotten in trouble or, or has had controversy or people haven't liked the fact that they have all these deals with local law enforcement to share things. So one would think that when Amazon announces something like this that seems a little wacky to people, that they would have already thought through Oh, will this be included in the video that we will share with our law enforcement partners? And this is quoting from the Wired piece on this. Amazon originally said the device would be included in the hundreds of video oh. sharing partnerships Amazon has with law enforcement agencies across the U.S. The company later sent a correction Ooh. and said the drone would be ineligible for this video request feature. So, okay, aside from the fact that I... I don't want law enforcement to be able to act, I mean, hopefully with a warrant or whatever, but I, I, I never want them to be able to like, give me, launch the drone, tell me where Brian is right now inside his house. You would think that if they were going to announce something like this, they would already have their ducks in a row with this very basic question, and apparently not. Uh, I'm sure law enforcement, I mean, I would like this if I could catch a crook and have good, clear video of the crook. In the act, that I mean, the ring doorbell's been used that way many, many times, right? Uh, it's just like having having that everywhere in your house. The prosecutions would go up. That's a good thing. Uh, so, Peter, could Amazon make this all better with the proper privacy policy and and commitment to enforce it? Would then everything, all of this that we just talked about, would it all be okay? I mean, I think part of it is whether people trust. Amazon or not, right? And and um, uh, you know, people have you know, if you have cameras or you have an Echo in your home and you have recordings of your voice, you want to have a feeling that um, 
you know, random people at Amazon don't can't look you up and access your, you know, your private information, your private videos. Um, it's the same thing with, I think, this partnership with the police, with the ring videos, um, you know, your videos aren't being sent automatically to the police. Yeah, I kind of was OK with it because you have to give permission uh, to do that. Yeah. And and so, you know, it's not in some respects that much different than I mean, we had an incident where somebody stole a car and parked in front of our house. And, um, you know, the we had reported it. And, um, you know, the detectives like, hey, do you have any cameras around the house? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, do you have any if you have any videos like of it? I have a video of, of someone rolling in um, and he's like, send that to me. And I was like, OK, you know, I didn't. Yeah, think, sure. That was a, that big of a no, deal. You're a good honest. citizen. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't help catch the person because it was, you know, pretty blurry, but um, that notwithstanding. Right. Um, you know, and so I, th I think that, again, um, not to go back to this issue on regulate regulation, but, um, you know, big companies are in the business of making money. And, um, you know, they do have to have a certain level of trust if they want to continue to, you know, sell these devices to people. But at the same time, I think they're not being when there isn't strong regulation or penalties for them behaving badly. Sooner or later, there are going to be things that happen and they need to be able to there needs to be a consequence attached to, you know, those sorts of privacy violations. And, you know, if you look in, it, you know, it's not an impossible thing to do. Um, you know, certainly the EU, uh, not that their regulation has been perfect, but, um, you know, they are um, holding companies uh, more accountable than we are in the U.S. for gross violations of privacy. And I think about the stuff that's happened, not just with, you know, your video or audio, but with private data. I mean, the fact that, um, uh, you know, what was it? Uh, was it Experian? Which one had the um, the the Equifax? Um, Equifax. You know, the fact that Equifax is still in business at all is crazy. I know. Um, and certainly that, you know, <laughs> and by the is way, much more damaging. People still trust their privacy. information with Equifax. Well, you don't have a choice. Yeah, I guess not. You, you saw, know, yeah. um, and, and, and but the fact is that, like, you know, we have a really inconsistent view ourselves of what is a violation and what isn't. Um, and. and you know, and, and so, you know, you think about like the potential damage that's been happened to a lot of people, you know, the Equifax breach actually, you know, has resulted in people's identities being stolen, oh, yeah. um, you know, things being compromised and not to minimize, you know, what's going on with with Amazon or, you know, with Google or Facebook or any of these things. But the fact is, you know, the data is being collected. And if we don't like the risks associated with that, we have to have different policies. And I know it goes back to what you said earlier, Leo, about the fact that we don't have a functioning government, but that's on us. Right. I mean, it's our job right. as citizens to have a government that works then that works and solves these problems. I mean, that's the point. The cynic you know, it, in me would say, we, that's why work, big business buys Congress. That's what, you know, we have the best government money can buy. And because Jeff Bezos has a lot more money to donate than I do, his will be done. But that's not, I mean, but they've lost, they didn't get the Jedi contract from the defense department. Right. I mean, it's, it's, you know, this stuff is not as simple as they just have the most money and they get what they want. Right. I think the fact is and then, you know, it's and I think that, you know, it means that us as citizens, if we if our only form of expressing our discontent with something is to not buy something, that's a problem. Right. Right. We have to have more avenues, and more channels for expressing our discontent, our displeasure with things and that we are aren't just consumers. We are citizens. And, you know, and I'm, I, I agree. I just don't want to like throw up our hands and say, well, there's nothing can be done. They're a big company and, and it's over. No, no, we need to do something. I agree. Um, and honestly, it may be require going to first principles and getting money out of politics first to make any effective. So we should start thinking about well, you know, what is, what would government do if we had a functioning government? How would we get that to happen? Uh, and how could we make that happen? And I think the first step would probably be to get the money out of politics because yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, we have to look at those things and we have to start to realize yeah. that, you know, these things aren't going to change on their own. Yeah. And again, and people are saying in the chat, you know, like, don't buy Amazon. Yeah. I mean, if you are uncomfortable, don't buy Amazon. Like, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think like I don't have a Facebook account. I haven't had a Facebook account in over 10 years. It's because I avidly disagree with the way that they run that business. Right. And I will say, if anything, is history has proven me 100 percent right <laughs> uh, on on the you know negative impact. of It's Facebook. far worse than we knew 10 years ago. Yeah, it was. It's what our worst nightmares were. <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe even worse than that. Uh, yeah, but, but on the other hand, but, I'm thinking if I, you know, my mom's 87, I just bought her an Apple Watch because I want the fall detection. I mean, in effect, she's got a surveillance device on her wrist so that I can keep an eye on her. And and you know what? I might even put a drone in her house. Uh, there's certainly, this is the problem. There are clear benefits. You know, every time I watch a crime procedural from more than 10 years ago 
on TV, I go, well, that couldn't happen today because there's cameras everywhere. There's, you can't get away. Somebody in the chat room said, what would, what would happen with OJ these days? There'd be video footage of everything. You know, you'd be able to piece the whole thing together. So that's probably good, but there are societal costs to that. Um, I think strong privacy policies that are uh, auditable and enforceable might go a long way towards this. There are definitely moves afoot to get uh, have people's data somehow be, you know, in a vault that you have control of so that you share it only when uh, you want to to people who give you the value for the data that it's worth, that kind of thing. I think there are solutions to this. But, we, but unfortunately, the way technology usually works is just a random walk to the future and we're i think we're right in the middle of that that's why i'm bringing these things yeah. up we're right in the middle well, of that random walk there, yeah we look we're in, in a, a transition period and there's a lot of dislocation and we've had a lot of change that's happened very very quickly and we're digesting a lot yeah. of it um and you know unfortunately um you know we're living through some extremely complicated times maybe that's a, a polite way to say it um you know, and, and it, it may be, you know, five to 10 years before we get to the other side of, of this turbulence and we have figured out all the solutions to a lot of this stuff. But ultimately, people have to have the political will, That's you know, right. to live, have things be different. And if right. they don't, they won't. Yeah. The, um, the problem is, of course, that COVID has been really good for Amazon. <laughs> I was just reading that Italy, where Amazon had been struggling, really never able to get a foothold in Italy. After COVID, their sales are up 75% because nobody's buying anything. They're, uh, you know, going, it's going into a store. They're buying everything online. It'd be pretty hard these days for me if I didn't have Amazon. If I took a, a principal position and didn't order from Amazon, who are you going to order from? Walmart? Oh, that's better. <laughs> I don't know what, I mean, I think this is a, a good time for Amazon. Don't you? Uh, all right, let's uh, move on to Apple. Who else can we skewer? It's funny, Peter, since you've been here, the tenor of our conversations has gone from isn't technology grand to <laughs> what fresh hell is this? <laughs> hey, I mean, I remember when I started Gizmodo, everything was yeah, like, right? hey, we're going to we're going to save the planet. We're yeah. going to change, save, we're going to, you know, everything's going to be a utopia where everyone has a Everyone's going to have a supercomputer in their pocket, and that's going to solve all of our problems. Well, that's the funny thing is we did get that future, and we and 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 it does solve problems, but it also creates problems. And maybe we weren't as good as anticipating the problems as we were the solutions. But, but we we never are. Never. <laughs> that's the, that's right. We never are. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, you've been doing this long enough too, uh, uh, Dwight. I mean, you've 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 watched the the dis, the utopia turn into dystopia. Up, oh, up! Oh, your microphone is pointing straight up, <laughs> and you're muted. There we go. Right. I, so I have I have toyed with writing a column about essentially apologizing for my optimism of the technology. Uh, from We'd all the have 90s to do that. Early two. We'd all have to do that. Right, kind of like kind of like the L.A. Times. Uh, you know, we apologize for our racism. Um, Right. section that came out today and it because it just feels like um a lot of it's kind of went at it blindly and there were people who were kind of going hey wait a minute stop out there and we were just going yeah yeah whatever and but a lot of them were right yeah although there still and is that tension a, now i mean there are a lot of people who say oh no this is all great it's fine yeah so uh, we want it you know we yeah, want it What's i do really want interesting, it you, and you know what's really interesting is you we started going into apple and Apple is creating a, a brand around being a company that will let you keep your privacy. And that, I think, is more significant yeah. than a lot of people realize. Not so what, much for what it says about Apple, but what it accurately says about Amazon and Facebook and Google. I'm actually surprised that, that uh, Apple's the only one that seems to be doing this. I thought at least Microsoft and a few others might say, hey, yeah, that's a good marketing uh, principle. Well, but except all the others are, um, a lot of their revenue, they including, <laughs> is advertising yeah, they based. Can't. Right, right. If you're going to do advertising, you know, you can't uh, do that. There was a one of the really interesting uh, websites that launched, I think it was last week or the week before, is uh, the Markups Blacklight I love site. that site, yeah. Yes, where you could go and put in any website and you can see all of the advertising and all the trackers uh, that, that come off of it. And... 
that is incredibly eye opening. Yeah. Yeah. You see, uh, yeah. Although a lot of, a lot of our listeners run ghostery and other tools. In fact, the new Firefox, uh, the new Safari, I should say, does this. Yeah, right, the new Safari, Safari is very, you know, yeah. very. But again, there's it's Apple again going. You know, we're going to give you your privacy. We're going to charge you more, right? Because uh, you know we're not don't have the revenue stream that invades your privacy. But that's a brand that is like becoming their brand. They get they hit that harder and harder in each one of their uh, events. Well, I, I want to get to Apple. All is not. Uh Goodness and light in the Apple universe, uh, there are a few people a little upset with Apple's uh, policies in the App Store. There's investigations going on in Europe and so forth. We'll get to that in uh, just a second. Great panel today, Dwight Silverman, the Tech Burger. You're not the Tech Burger. You write for the Tech Burger. No, I'm merely a Tech Burger. <laughs> and and uh, it, it was a it was a joke name when we were putting the site up, and and my editor liked it enough to actually inflict it on me. So yeah, be careful uh, about the jokes you make. You may. <laughs> yes, and now we've got, I'm, I'm doing a weekly column again, and it's called Tech Burger. And Good. so I cannot Good. get away. Good, he is the Tech Burger, I'm telling you. Also, the return, triumphant return of Peter Rojas. We haven't <laughs> seen him in a while. Founder of Engadget and Gizmodo. Uh, he is now a, uh, would you say angel? Would you say early stage? What's your, what's BetaWorks doing we're doing uh, pre-seed and seed stage VC. Pre-seed? So, yeah. Okay. So you're at the very earliest stages. Very earliest stages, yeah. We're usually often first investor in a lot of companies. That's a good place to be. Yeah. I have a it few, can be, yeah. I have a few friends who were first investors in companies like Twitter and Uber. I see them sailing off into the sunset on their mega yachts. Uh, yeah, I, I still have a few years to go. I think, for that. <laughs> uh, this is cool. Did you found this or uh, do this with friends or what's? So I have two partners. Um, you know, there's original Betaworks, which started in 2007. And that's where um, a bunch of companies were built like Giphy. Uh, the game Dots came out of there. Wait Bitly. a minute. Wait a minute. Giphy or Jiffy? Giphy. Okay. Yeah. There we have it from the from the guy, from the horse's mouth. It's Not the Giphy founder, the but you put the money in Giphy. That's how... Giphy. That's how that, that's Thank Alex, you. the founder of Giphy. That's how he called. Did it he Giphy. have a big exit when the when they got acquired? I hope yeah, he did really well. Nice, very nice. That's a so. perfect example. Sole founder, simple idea, developed well, hit the nail on the head, and had a nice exit. That's what you're yeah. hoping for, isn't it? it, it well, and it, it, it's it was something that was um, it was actually built at BetaWorks. It started as a BetaWorks. Oh, incubator. nice. So, yeah, he. It was like we had a hackers in residence program that he oh, was nice. part of. Um, Four hundred million is the rumor. Facebook paid for Giphy. I can't confirm. That. <laughs> okay, I tried. You saw anyway. me. I tried. I did. I did Sorry. my best. I didn't say anything. I just said it. <laughs> <laughs> Still, even if it was half that, it was a good. It was a good exit. That's great. It it, it was good. Yeah. yeah. And you know, and so BetaWorks Ventures was spun out of the original BetaWorks, and so we do all the investing. Nice. Um, and we have our own fund. I have two partners. Uh, oh, you John did dots. I love dots. We did dots, yeah. <gasps> I wasn't there when they did dots. But dots is so good. Bitly, Chartbeat. Yep. TweetDeck. Tweet Deck. I still use TweetDeck. Pray that Twitter does not kill it. I I think that they will keep it around. It's for people. It's for the power users. Yeah, no, but they don't even tell anybody it exists. <laughs> no. But. <laughs> but it's still, it's really, really the only way I use Twitter. It's awesome. Because it's got live scrolling. You know what the killer feature of TweetDeck, and I don't think any other Twitter-made uh, platform does this. You can say, I don't want to see retweets in any one of the columns, which really dampens down the kind of insane volatility. You know, you only see the first initial tweet. That's it. I, somebody suggested I do that, and I've loved it ever since. And there's no ads. That's right. Which I, you know, I... We have lots of ads, so I don't. <laughs> it would be hypocritical of me to say. <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, currently focused on conversational interfaces, bots, verbal computing, and augmented reality. Seems like a good place to be. Yeah, we're, uh, well, that's actually slightly out of date, but um, but yeah, we're investing a lot around uh, social gaming right now. Nice. Uh, and um, interested in the metaverse. What's coming out of the yeah. people trying to build stuff like that? Nice. Um, doing a lot around spatial computing and AR. Uh, just made another investment in that uh, that category. And then um, you know, people sort of the way we define it is the future of how people live, work, and play online. Yeah. 
which Seems obviously like, was a, a big year for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I finally realized I should just invest in technology. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like that's got an upside a little bit, right? Um, Twit.vc. Oh, you think? Yet yeah, Kevin Rose always said, you've got deal flow. No, it was Calacanis. You've got deal flow. You should, you do, you could do this. I said, I don't want to do that. I have no interest in it. None at all. None at all. I like doing what we're doing. We're having fun. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk. But anyway, congratulations. It's great to see you again. Thanks. Yeah. And, it's great uh, to be back. Yeah. Yeah. We missed you. Well, good. I hope you'll make this a regular uh, visit. And of course, we love Brian McCullough, who's God, seven days a week now. You're doing uh, the tech meme rhyme. Hope tech meme rhyme. Well, uh, not not technically uh, every every weekday, but then I do usually two or three weekend yeah. bonus episodes. Yeah, yeah, that counts. Could be eight days yeah. a week, really. Let's call it. Let's call it twenty four ish episodes a month. Wow. That's exhausting. The, <laughs> the key thing is it. the key thing is every day by 5 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, deadline. Which the weird thing is, the weird thing is, is I've been putting them out at two recently because you know it's amazing if you don't have a 45 minute commute each yeah. way, mm -hmm. how your your day flow. But but I, I told people this week, you know, the kids are starting to go back to school, so you might see it uh, <laughs> inching towards 4 p.m. 5 p.m. now because I got to get uh, kids out the door every your morning. Your kids so. are going. Where where are you located? Uh, Bro Brooklyn. And the kids are going uh, back to school in Brooklyn. Yeah, I mean that's the whole experiment here in New York City. Um, that I've got a that's a fun to experiment that with a deadly disease, isn't on, it? On your on your kids, isn't that too. a good experiment? Yeah, <laughs> on your kids with a deadly disease. What fun is that? So it's it's staggered, like it's not a hundred percent in person. For example, my four year old went two days this week to pre K. Um, my six year old is going to first grade two days next week. And it, so it's, it's never full time. Jeez. And, and the way the, the reason for that is then they can cut the class sizes down. So you're only in right. a classroom with right. seven other kids or whatever. We bought, um, medical grade air purifiers for yes. all the classrooms. Yes. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we were trying to do everything. We're trying, like, listen, we're optimistic because it's either we're going to do nothing or we're going to try to right. do something. Right. And look, if I can get two days a week for either of these kids just to socialize and have a, have a first grade oh, teacher so and good have for a first grade class. Yeah. yeah. We're, 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 it's worth, you know, cross your fingers. It's, it's worth the stretch to see if it can work. We know? have a high school senior at home and I just keep thinking, I always keep one eye open at night. I'm worried about knife attacks. I don't know. I just feel like the poor kid. It's so stressful. And he's so sick of us. He just can't. He said, Can you go somewhere, please? Nope. Gonna stay here. Going somewhere well, I mean, means uh, going down to Trader Joe's for five minutes. That's it. We we're lucky because until now, where you know, in New York City and New York State, it's been uh, yeah, under one percent okay test now? positivity yeah, rate all yeah. this time. Although it has been spiking recently, so it, it could shut down next week. But also, I feel like we're in a locality where if the numbers do get bad. They will shut it down. Yes. And they're not going to mess around. No. So, again, that's what's making me willing to yeah. take this risk. You have a good governor who's paying attention. Peter, are your kids back in school too? Not, not really. Um, they're doing this thing where they have three days a week hikes that they can oh, go on with the that's class. That's good. That's um, perfect. Yeah. So that's it's outdoors. Perfect. Yeah. It's optional. Yeah. Um, they get some time, you know, some socially distanced time with their friends. Um, you know, we don't have to see them for a couple of hours. Yeah, that's good for all uh, each day. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and you know, but the problem was the first week they started it was the first week that the fires were really bad. Yeah, so the air was terrible. And so yeah. they had to cancel it the first week, and yeah. then it finally got good enough. And you know, are you so in like, uh, Silicon Valley? Where whereabouts? I'm right in the center of San Francisco. Oh, San Francisco. Okay. Yeah, I like the, yeah outdoors. I'm not. I'm no longer afraid of outdoors. Uh, I feel like th that's pretty safe. It's the indoors you got to worry about. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. 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 Not that I know anything. All I could say is I haven't got it yet. Uh, our show today, <laughs> you know, if you're stuck at home, might as well take advantage of that time you're sitting in front of the TV. Sure, you could watch a, a Desperate Housewives rerun, or you could learn a skill from Masterclass, our sponsor. I love Masterclass. I have been a subscriber for years now. In fact, the funny thing I told my son, who's 26... 
I uh, just had just gotten out of college a few years ago. I said, good, I'm going to give you a master class for graduation. He said, oh, I'm already. I, <laughs> he does all the uh, cooking stuff. In fact, I just got a really nice barbecue, and I was so thrilled to see Aaron Franklin with a master class on barbecue. Man, I followed his brisket. You know, it's like there's a ton of videos. I followed his brisket recipe. It was the best thing I ever had. From 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 point of view of cooking, their master class is amazing. Thomas Keller, Gordon Ramsay, and he won't even yell at you. Gabriela Camara teaches you how to make homemade tortillas. Aaron's uh, barbecue. Massimo teaches Italian cooking. Wolfgang Puck. Alice Waters. That's just the cooking section. But there's much more. Master class isn't just cooking. How about you like theater? You like film? You like acting? The arts and entertainment section is mind-boggling. How do they get these... A-list people, Samuel L. Jackson, Spike Lee, learn how to act from Natalie Portman, David Lynch, Martin Scorsese. And I should point out, these classes, uh, it's not just, oh, here's a quick video. There are many videos. Scorsese has introduction, beginnings, Martin's education, discovering your process, channeling your influences, developing your style, directing and technology, finding the story, on and on, editing one and two. There are 30 episodes. They're all uh, digestible, which is great. You can watch them at any time on any device. Masterclass is the way to learn all sorts of things. Oh, this is new. Neil Gaiman. Art of storytelling? No, man, I know what I'm watching tonight. So if you're tired of the same old, same old, you got to get master class. How about learning from the all time, six time winner of the World Series of Poker champion? The guy who was won more than anybody else, Daniel Negrano. Okay, if you wanted to f learn about political strategy, who better to learn from <laughs> than David Axelrod and Karl Rove, Obama's advisor and uh, Bush's advisor? And what's great is they're sitting next to each other. <laughs> there are 24 lessons on campaign strategy, assessing your candidate, researching your opponent, <laughs> fundraising, public appearances. This, you want to know how politics works. Nobody knows more about politics than Rove and Axelrod together. Is that hysterical? What a brilliant idea. Look, all right. I'm sorry. I just wanted to mention that one because I think it's so cool. I, uh, I have an all-access pass. And that's, by the way, what I would recommend because then you get access to every single one of these incredible videos. It's immersive. You can watch it on your phone, your Apple TV, your web. Carlos Santana on the art and soul of guitar, right? Learn how to, learn how to hit aces from Serena Williams. I wonder if she talks about uh, Ohanian on that. That'd be kind of fun. Um, it, I, I can go on and on. Get unlimited access to every master class. And because you're listening, we're going to get you 15% off an annual membership. It is worth it. Family and friends, if you're sitting down in front of the TV, you could, you will find no time better spent than in a masterclass. Masterclass.com slash twit2. That's the uh, special URL to get the 15% off. Masterclass.com slash twit2. I am ready for a masterclass in promotional advertisements. This is what you missed if you missed anything this week on Twit. The cat came back. <laughs> I, I pressed some yeah, button but... now and I can't... <laughs> Every switch I pushed. I can't imagine why you wanted someone else to do the Ethernet in your house. <laughs> Previously on Twit. All about Android. Android's earthquake alert feature was put to the test last week. A 4.5 magnitude earthquake hit the Los Angeles area. This week in Google. Why is Google still making phones? And the second question is, will they continue doing this? Is this the last Pixel phone? Their main business model seems to be to disappoint users. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a tragic. But still, we have to ask, wh why are they doing it and will they stop? Smart Tech Today. There's a one and a two switch, and really you'll never need to use more than the one switch, but it does have that two switch if you want it. Here's the two. Oh my God. Perfect for those weird TikTok selfies. 
It sounds so, like you were blown away. Twit. I was blown away, Kevin. That's exactly <laughs> right. It's where your brain and tech meet. Oh, we have fun every week on Twit. There's lots of shows to watch. And our live stream is at twit.tv slash live. If you like Twit and you have Amazon's uh, Echo, we uh, have a flash briefing uh, as well. You know, uh, the flash briefing, the morning news segment you can uh, listen to. I, I listen to a lot of things. Uh, but you can get Twit on there, too. So check your flash briefing settings and add Twit to that. Brian, do you have a Tech Mead Rhyme Home uh, flash briefing? I would we do. To that. do yeah. you, you, you want to mention that right now? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Let's add it because I. Uh, yeah, I yeah, yeah. That. No, it's there. I. You they're, know what I don't doing... like? They do, uh, and it pisses me off. A lot of uh, you know automatic voice, you know synthesis of text stories. I want to hear you tell me the news, not you know, not some yeah. machine. No, 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 um, no. I mean, it's it's mainly you you set it up so that because it's a daily show. So uh, if you set it up to be your your flash briefing it is whatever the most recent show is so it's it's sort of it's a glorified um putting my podcast at the top of a queue or something like that's that. what i'll do because that's worth listening to but then i would get yesterday's news today because it's you finish it at five and then i listen in the morning it's okay and catch up well, actually i think most people do at this point listen in the mornings anyway so. yeah 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 somebody in the chat in the chat room just sent me this tweet from the la times kind of a flashback to the good old days of the space shuttle when they drew drove the space shuttle to the science center through the city look at the size of that thing going down the highways people on balconies watching as the space shuttle goes by look at that wow i don't think i don't think that was very recent but uh i just thought that was pretty cool all right we should mention uh, jason howell was talking about it on all about android uh, or maybe we were talking about it on This Week in Google. I guess we were. Uh, on Wednesday, we're going to do a little bit of a jiggery-jiggering of our shows. We'll begin early with Windows Weekly at 9 a.m. so that we can, by 11 a.m. Is it 11? John, do you remember? 11 a.m., we're going to do the uh, Google announcement. Uh, they're going to stream it. We'll do our usual coverage as we watch the streamed. Remember those days, Peter, when you had to sit and live blog an announcement? You don't do that anymore, I bet. Uh, I don't, but um, but we we were the first site to do that. Were you? Um, you yeah. mean in Gadget? Um, yeah. Nice. Um, we we had somebody. The way you used to do it is uh, the phones, the connections were so slow that one person would be there in the room, and then uh, they would be sending the messages over AIM. Oh my uh, God! On AIM. Me. Who would then put it into the CMS? Oh my God! Uh, <laughs> see, this is what we need on the Internet History Podcast. See, that's yeah. how long ago it was. They were using AOL's Instant Messenger, the late yeah, great. It was uh, it was wow. a real process, right? Wow. And this was whole software. Soft, they have software platforms for that now, right? Oh yeah, they totally. Well, yeah, well, they yeah. did. You know what? They may be gone now. For a while, there was this boom in live blogging, and they had a bunch of platforms. I bet they're all gone by now. I think, I think they each, are. I think yeah. a lot of the sites have their own. Yeah, but, they do their own thing. I think at one point there was a plug-in for um, AIM that where you could essentially use it to live blog and it would send it to certain CMSs. And so uh, yeah. you could actually do it directly. You wouldn't need the other guy typing it in. I think some yeah. of this went away <laughs> when companies like Apple, thank God, finally started live streaming instead of, you know, they'd put it up on YouTube so the public could watch. Yeah. And so we wouldn't have to go to Engadget to see... Uh, what's going on? Yeah, there's still some live blog. Uh, 24liveblog.com. Real-time infrastructure for today's newsroom. So there are still some uh, businesses doing that. But I think that that's not... Although, you know what? Amazon, they didn't stream it. Had to watch a live blog. Google will stream on Wednesday. We'll cover that at 11 a.m. Uh, we expect... Well, there's never any mystery with Google. <laughs> I don't know what the story is. If they just have no opsec at all, or they don't care, it well, got don't to you think they just they they gave, they threw in the towel? They're like, the, yeah. the heck with it. This is too much trouble. We'll, 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 yeah, we'll just let you know ahead of time. Yeah, it ha it started like last year, or the year before, when they just right after there was so right. many leaks, they just said, all right, here's the Pixel Four. Fine. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, it it doesn't really matter that much anymore. Does it? It, uh, no. it just doesn't. So that's one way times have changed. It used to be we were all excited. And, you know, Apple event morning was like Christmas Day. 
you'd be getting, the, the, but not the peak of that was that was the iPhone four, right? Like that was that, that was the one where the, 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 um, the uh, demo device leaked and uh, yeah, it was stolen. Like that was it the was stolen. Right, stolen. stolen. Yeah. Exactly. Oh right. yeah. Right. It was left in a bar. Right. In fact, like, it, it was Gizmodo. Up. I believe were you still at Gizmodo when that happened? <laughs> no, I, I, I long gone. Was yeah, it Brian right. Lamb who, who uh, ended up taking right, the heat for right, that? Right. Yeah. Dealing with that. Yeah. Yeah. Brian and, and Jason Chen. He's done okay since because Brian went off and started Wirecutter, right? Yep. Which is now a New York Times property. And Brian, again, riding off into the sunset on his mega yacht. Uh, so Pixel 5, we'll see. Does any... That was... Mike Elgin was asking a good question on that promo. Why bother? Why does Google even make a phone? The one rumor I thought was really interesting is that it might not be expensive. That it might be a $600 phone, not a $1,000 phone. That's what they should be doing, right? That's what the Nexus line was. The whole idea originally of Google making phones was an inexpensive phone developers could use to test their Android apps on. And then the public got wind of it, and it turned out they were the best Android phones out there because they were pure. So Google, I think, probably said, oh, we can make some money on this. But in typical Google fashion, <laughs> they lost, well, didn't, they wasn't lost it the with, thread. With Google, didn't they want a pure phone out there? Wasn't it similar to to Microsoft deciding to finally get into tablets and its but, own hardware. Uh, yeah, but do you need... Where they wanted to say, here's how it's done. Here's how yes. you guys... Yes. Yes, but they don't need that anymore because there's so many companies no, that make basically Android phones. Even Samsung. I mean, I'm looking at this, you know, the Fold. It's really pretty much... It's got some Samsung in it. Not got a lot of Samsung in it. It's pretty much a, a, an and, a stock Android device. Even, you know, the Samsung used to customize the settings like crazy. They ba it basically gotten much more stock. And certainly OnePlus and Motorola and uh, many of the other companies are just making, they, you know, they're not customizing it that much, which is a good thing. You're more likely to get your updates more quickly. So then that begs the question, why do we need a new Pixel phone? I always thought that, you know, Google's rationale for doing this has changed over the years. But it seems to me like one reason why they continue to do it is at least to give them the ability to exert some leverage over the OEMs if they need to. And whether their need to do that wanes and, you know, it, it ebbs and flows over the over the years, depending on, uh, you know, at one point, Samsung was becoming so dominant with Android um, that yes. they, they were worried about having a counterweight to it. That's uh, right. And, Andro and Samsung was even talking about forking Android. Um, and, you know, they had such a large share of the market that I don't think they would have executed it well, but they could have tried uh, to do that. And so, you know, it seems to me it's like it's a little bit like a, don't make us have to make Pixel a big deal. OK. Is that still the rationale? I don't know. It may still be useful to them to have it something that they continue to do uh, for that sort of strategic you know, purpose. Um, they well, certainly if they wanted it to be something that more people bought, they would be going about it very differently. Yes. Well, yeah, they'd have more carrier, carrier deals for one thing. Yeah. Um, it. I have to say, not this Samsung Fold doesn't have Android 11 on it. Uh, very few phones do. So that's one thing. Apple, you know, a new version of iOS comes out, like iOS 14 did last week, and, you know, they get 50% adoption within a week. Everybody jumps on it. And that's good all around. It's good for security. It's good for developers because it's they know yep. what people are going to be using. Um, so maybe that's it. Maybe they're just trying to say, look, we got to get Android 11 going. Um, also, Google uh, arguably does the best cameras out there, uh, right? I mean, I think all of the flagship phones now, uh, iPhone, Samsung, have excellent cameras. But I always, f I always have felt like the Pixels are the best Android phones made. overall. Yeah, Samsung has always made the sexiest yes. phones. Yes. But uh, so maybe you know another question uh, aside from how long will they continue to do this because no one ever goes broke <laughs> betting against Google getting bored of something. But um, uh, why haven't the Pixels taken off more? Uh, is it just the carrier stuff? Like they, they haven't been able to get the deals like Samsung does? or They it's certainly the do. They do well with the A versions, right? The 4A's done very well. 
The 3A did very well. Those are the phones to get. They're the less expensive, lower-end versions of the Pixel phones. They're more like the old Nexus line. And they've sold well, but Pixels in general do not sell well. So, I'm sorry, what, what were you saying, Dwight? Uh, they, it's. I, th I think it's distribution. I don't think they just don't get. I don't think they're there. very good at, at getting the products out there. They right. they introduce them. They're good products, but in terms of being promoting them and making sure that every carrier has them, that um, you know that all the, the the best sources for getting them have them. I have heard from a lot of people who say, "I'd like to buy a Pixel phone. How do I do that?" And um, and it's often kind of uh, you know not. It's not intuitive for a lot of people. How so that. Happens. That underscores that there are really two markets for Android devices. There's the enthusiast market. Those people know how to get a Pixel phone. Right. But those people also know all the problems the Pixel phones have, you know. The last two times, there have been issues. And the word goes out very quickly in the enthusiast community. Then there is the vast majority of Android buyers who uh, are not sophisticated users. They're buying, most of the time, they're buying Android devices because they're the less expensive phone or the phone they get for free from their carrier, that kind of thing. Pixel phone's not even on their radar. They wouldn't, you know, that's not even, they don't even know it exists probably. And if they did, they, you're right. They don't know how to get it. So it doesn't, it doesn't work on either, uh, for either of the two Android markets. So it's, uh, it's probably a. It's probably. I think if they if they were flop. better at distribution, if they were better at marketing it, if they uh, if they put it where it needed to be, uh, and had just like you know a killer phone. I mean, I, I heard some. I heard you say I think that they have uh, the pixels have the best cameras. I don't think that's true. I think not anymore. Certainly, the last yeah. pixel was um, outdone by the iPhone, uh, particularly with night mode, and um, I just think that that they. They they have a, a, a really a missed opportunity because Google is is uh, has its name and has you know, one of the biggest websites there is, but they don't do much there in order to uh, promote it. They don't have ads for uh, the Pixel for sure, right? Okay, all right. I'm just wondering. So maybe we'll see Google. What we would look for Wednesday is maybe Google announcing carrier partnerships because uh, that would be a big deal for Google. And this is this is a five G phone too, so. Yeah, that that kind of changes the game a little. Uh, yeah, maybe a little. <laughs> Leo, Leo, what was the consensus back to the original question, which was, is this the last Pixel phone? What was the consensus on the shows this well, week? Nobody knows, but everybody kind of agreed it should be. <laughs> mm. In See, fact, I, well, why? What, I, I mean, don't I want it to be. You, 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 do you? Do you have a Pixel? Do you use the Pixel? Uh, yeah, I, I have had them. Um, I'm back on an iPhone now, but um, go ahead, Peter. Oh, well, I was going to say, I think the, I think part of it is that you know Google's a big company, and you know they obviously need Android to be successful. Right. They don't need the Pixel to be successful. And it's and not I think, good news. And, it, <laughs> and it's not. But I mean, I think that you know there are things that are existential or, or mission critical for big companies, and there are things that are not. And uh, it's not a surprise that things that are not. Um, are, are, are not going to get as much support or attention, or maybe the right. best people internally. And not to denigrate anybody who works on the Pixel phone by uh, by implying that but you can sometimes tell internally uh, you can sometimes tell the C, you know a ceo's priorities around what they think is the most important thing for them to be working on and i would say that um you know for sundar it's probably not the pixel phone it's probably more around ai more generally um and probably like google assistant um in terms of consumer facing products the information had a story uh not so long ago about rick osterloh who's in charge of um hardware uh, at Google, weeks before the launch of the last Pixel, the Pixel 4, saying, this battery life is terrible. Like, Rick, didn't you know you found out just two, two weeks before the ship date? And then uh, Mark Lavoie, who is the camera guru, who, if Google's cameras were good, is widely credited with that. He left, went to Adobe, where he's working on, I don't know, software. Um those it, are the those are the reading the tea leaves that tell you because I remember when that story came out too. Yeah, not good. Mm -mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. something something's up at the Pixel. There's sunk cost in this one coming out, and then um, you know, also like you said, it's a 5G launch. Everyone wants their 5G phones out there, so yeah, I don't know. I you know, the, so that's this is a good question for you guys. Are you are you hearing uh, people, normal people, saying, "Oh, I I got to get a 5G phone." 
What about you, Dwight? Do, I, you, do people write to you and say, oh, I need a 5G phone. What should I get? Um, there was initially, and I think a lot of the reviews of um, the networks that have gone live, particularly AT&T's and T-Mobile, where there's only like a 20% increase in speeds, and the really fast speeds um, are hard to find for with uh, both AT&T and Verizon. You know, I did, I did a review of AT&T's network when it launched here, and the only place they have millimeter wave is some locations downtown. One of them is in front of the building where the uh, rockets play. And, um, and I went out there with the phone, and when I was sitting in my car on the street next to the building, I was getting the sub-six speeds, and I walked out and stood in the middle of the, uh, of the plaza, and I got, uh, you know, I was getting like almost a, a gigabit down. And, wow. But then if I moved like 100 feet away, I got sub six speeds again. And so, yeah. you know, the, the experience right now, 5G has been sold on millimeter wave to the public. That's where the hype is. And nobody's going to get think, that. And nobody, right. And nobody's getting that. And I think people are understanding now. I do think people want it for the future. I think if you're thinking ahead and if you're an enthusiast or maybe one step beyond an enthusiast uh, where you know, you kind of know what you want, uh, you want a 5G phone now. But I think most people are not going, oh, my God, this is a 5G phone. I got to have it. I, but in about a year, it's maybe not gonna have it's, it's going to come. Everything. Well, yeah, this uh, this fold is 5G. And I put a Verizon SIM in it, and I got a confusing message, which I never really understood. But something about your SIM needs, if you're going to get 5G, you're going to need to, I don't know, do something. But I knew it was nonsense because there's no Verizon 5G anywhere near me So because it's millimeter wave. So I just right. said, yeah, fine, whatever. So <laughs> uh, PC Magazine does that annual um, you know, mobile networks testing. They go to 26 cities. Sasha Segan uh, does this every year. Came out a couple of weeks ago. He said AT&T's 5G is actually slower than LTE. Yeah. Uh, and that no, you know, 5G isn't is when it, when you can get it, if you can actually get it, is great. But no one's getting it anywhere. So it's I, it's kind of a disappointment. I, I did that story and I said because I've been I, I've had to do several of those recently, and I and the point I've been making is everyone remembers going to 3G versus Edge, you know? Oh, that was huge. And like, yeah. Right. And and so everyone has been hearing for however many years that 5G is coming. So everyone's expecting the same thing, except for the fact that, remember, also, a lot of people never had smartphones before. On Like, we had, <laughs> enthusiasts had smartphones on Edge networks and whatever. So you, if you remember back, like most people's experience of having their first smartphone and how it changed their lives was having a fast internet and having a phone that could handle it. So I kind of feel like you asked the question originally, are people Asking waiting for, for 5G? Yeah. yeah, I think that they are because they remember that they either remember the jump to 3G or right. they remember that it was around that time that they got their first smartphone and it changed their lives. Right. And it's just not going to do that. That's not going to do that. Here's the... No. The bottom line in the PC Magazine, here's the quote. To make a long story short, AT&T 5G right now appears to be essentially worthless. T-Mobile 5G can be a big boost over 4G, but its speeds are only what we'd expect from a good 4G network. It isn't a new experience. Verizon's 5G is often mind-blowing, but very difficult to, f to find. In, <laughs> like in, Houston, in, in three blocks I've in New York noticed, City, that's it. <laughs> in, in Houston, I've noticed that uh, on the 4G phones I, I have, um, including the, the 11 Pro Max that I carry every day, that the 4G network has gotten better because the backhaul uh, for the entire area yeah, has gotten that makes a bigger difference. I got, yeah. Yes, I got, a, I got 120 megabits down on a 4G uh, smartphone the other day, and it was just, you know, that was really impressive. And what was funny, I had a 5G phone with me on the same network and like the like the AT&T um, uh, example it did not do as well as the 4G at that particular moment I guess it's kind of moot because if you get a new phone you'll it'll be 5G but the Pixel 5 will be 5G the new iPhone 12 will be 5G the Samsung is 5G it, and, it, and it's unlike last year when it was a premium priced product that cost you more because you had to buy a 5G subscription 
it's just it's just more like the uh, the evolution from 3G to LTE. It's just a, a natural upgrade everybody will get. But I you know don't don't hold your breath, kids. If you're if you're looking for a life changing experience, I don't think it's going to be that. At the same time, LTE is pretty fast. It's probably as fast as anybody needs. Or am I wrong? Does anybody say, "Oh gosh, I need more speed"? Supposedly, the supposedly one of the big deals with and with which is coming with both sub six and millimeter wave is uh, reduced latency. Low latency. Yeah, and, that's what I was going to yeah. say. The latency, I think, is the bigger issue for a lot of the applications than. Particularly for cars, itself. right? Well, cars, yes, but I mean, even social applications or gaming, gaming. Um, anything where yeah. gaming. you're paying to the server time is meaningful, um, you know, the latency is going to make a big difference. Actually, that's a very good point because we are moving, there's another big trend, I think, to cloud gaming. And uh, the idea that you could do uh, AAA games on a mobile device over a mobile network it's pretty compelling, but it's going to require some uh, low latency and some decent speed, but mostly low latency for it to work. Well, and that was what all the hype was with 5G all these past few years right. is like th that w we'll do cloud gaming, we'll do virtual surgeries, we'll do your right. car that will allow self-driving cars to happen. But yeah, I mean, most of the time, basically, though, people aren't going to notice that on their phone unless they're doing those specific things. Well, and what we're learning is that for the next 18 months or so, at least in the U.S., all you're really going to get is faster LTE because right. <laughs> they're building yeah. out the, the infrastructure. Right. Yeah, That's what you're getting. Google is also expected to announce a new Chromecast. Well, we know they will because Walmart accidentally listed it <laughs> last, last week. <laughs> so uh, here's the picture from the Walmart listing. This is uh, they're saying with Android TV, and it even comes with a remote with a button for YouTube and Netflix. So that's interesting. Android TV has been a laggard for a long time. I'm a big Android TV fan. I think I'm the only one. But that's because I have an NVIDIA Shield device, which is a very powerful, speaking of mobile gaming, it plays the GeForce Now streaming games. It's a really nice TV device, but it's, over, it's expensive. It's as much or more than an Apple TV. And it doesn't have all the channels because they haven't made deals with HBO and other, you know, and Comcast and stuff. So... I, you know, I kind of limited what I could watch on it. If it were as if it had all the features of an Apple TV or a Roku, it'd be awesome. So I'd love to see some support for Android TV going forward. This might be an important uh, update. We'll watch, uh, we'll watch on, uh, on Wednesday with interest. Speaking of streaming gaming, that I mentioned there's a battle uh, going on in Cupertino. With Epic uh, uh, Games and Spotify and Tile, they have for formed the Coalition for App Fairness to, f quote, fight back against Apple, an independent nonprofit organization founded by industry-leading companies to advocate for freedom of choice and fair competition across the app ecosystem. You know who's missing from this list is M Microsoft, who actually, you could argue, is perhaps the one that will be most disadvantaged from the fa uh, by Apple's re refusal to put xCloud on there without major modifications. Listen, Microsoft has been benefiting a lot by keeping their heads down yeah. and not having it's a to good go time to shut up and things like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But also, I kept all this week. Uh, the real name they should have done was Rebel Alliance. I kept yelling it at them, like, <laughs> just call it yourselves is. the Rebel Alliance. Well, listen, it's Epic Games, Spotify, Tile. Those all three have been very vocal for months in complaining. Tile actually testified in Congress saying, we can't compete against Apple's imaginary air tags. Uh, Basecamp, they're the ones who did, hey, the email program that swiftly sank after a f very, very vocal fight against Apple. Blix, blockchain. I didn't even know there was a thing called blockchain. Uh, Deezer, the music uh, company, which, you know, like Spotify is probably a little scared more by Apple One and the Apple Bundle than anything else. European Publishers Council, they don't like anything on the internet. News Media Europe, <laughs> ditto. Proton Mail, which is an encrypted mail program, and Sky Demon. Uh, they're lobbying other j developers to join them. The problem is these are all, these are all people in, in certain ca specific categories. They're big people. Most like onesie twosie developers are thrilled with Apple. They don't mind the 30% tax. They love it. They can make money on the uh, app platform if they can get their app through. Uh, is there a problem in the app store? What do you think, Peter? 
I think that the rules that they laid down 10 years ago with the introduction of the App Store um, were for a different internet than we have now. Uh, um, and and yeah. certainly, you know, uh, the introduction of cloud services, um, you know, the explosion of, frankly, of like enterprise, uh, you know, SaaS, um, you know, the new kinds of subscription and uh, uh, services which are being, you know, introduced now. Um, and I think that, you know, setting aside, let's set aside whether 30% is the fair number or not. I mean, I think that's debatable and certainly, you know, whether or not Apple has a monopoly or not uh, is, you know, factors into that and, and that might be a matter of perspective. Um, but I think that Apple ripping up the rule book and saying we're going to start over and sort of try to figure out something that feels coherent now um, versus, uh, you know, having this sort of exception they have like exceptions to the exceptions to the exceptions now yeah. um, that sort of govern things. And yeah. I think for developers and we invest in a lot of, you know, people building, you know, apps that, that do have some uh, product or service of one kind that, you know, Apple takes a 30 percent cut off cut of. Um, I think it's that, you know, sometimes it doesn't feel fair uh, who, you know, uh, what things are subject to that fee and what things aren't. Uh, and that, you know, Apple increasingly is sort of twisting itself in, in knots, trying to have some coherent articulation of what the policies are. And so I think they should start over. And I think and I think, frankly, given how big they are, given how long term valuable it is and important for them to have developers on their side, I think it would be in their while to, you know, cut the fee um, or introduce different structures. I mean, I think that they probably didn't anticipate that there would be companies like Facebook, Facebook and you know, TikTok uh, that would have hundreds of millions of users on their platform uh, and and essentially, you know, run those businesses for free and not give Apple any, you know, they don't, Facebook doesn't give Apple 30% of ads that are sold through, you know, their iOS app, Facebook's iOS app. And so, you know, you can imagine Facebook saying, this is great, but if you're going to have an app with more than a million monthly active users on our platform or whatever volume, maybe you have to pay some, you know, fee or something like that. I'm just sort of, you know, throwing out ideas, but I think that like they could start over now and sort of say, given what we have now, the landscape we have now for apps, what would we do? Because they're constrained by what they decided 10 years ago. I agree. And yet, and everybody, I think everybody who thinks about this logically agrees. For some reason, Apple does not. They're digging in their heels. Why? Why doesn't Leo, Apple? Oh, I think they'll, I think they'll come around. They're going to have to. They will. The, the they just don't do it. Pub it. They don't do it publicly. Right. So, the thing so one of the things it. that Spotify complained about, everybody, this this coalition complained about, is the side deal Eddie Q made with Jeff Bezos for Amazon uh, that allows Amazon to kind of bypass the thirty percent in the store, and that's a problem because they can. Everybody points to that and say, "See, Apple will make a deal with you, but not with us." And that is that is something I would imagine antitrust regulators would be interested. Sorry, Brian, go ahead. Well, I think the thing. It, it'll be it'll not be epic that puts it over the edge but it will be gaming because we know that gaming is bigger than hollywood in terms of a, an industry uh, by by multiples at this point and we no one would ever expect that uh netflix would have to pay uh per movie or whatever like i know that, that there's all these machinations in terms of like the subscription and like how you go off but the idea that everybody in tech and the entire gaming industry, which is bigger than Hollywood, is moving towards delivering their product digitally. And Apple wants to step in front of that to 30%. Like there are ways that that is unsustainable for all the other people in this huge market and this ecosystem. Like Apple's going to have to cut deals because otherwise it's literally going to be this entire thing that will be the, the reason that people won't go to, I, I can't go to, I, when I was a kid, I wasn't a Mac user cause I couldn't play PC games on Macs. Right. Yep. And it, that, history could repeat itself. It's going to be this whole move to streaming gaming that is going to, as Peter says, make them reevaluate. All right. We had rules in place for a certain period of time and they don't fit. Times this have period changed. Time. Times yeah. have changed. Yeah. That's why I, I'm surprised Microsoft is not. But you're right. They're smart to keep their heads down because that's going to be the big one is xCloud. And Apple said, yeah, you can put xCloud on there, but each game has to be a standalone app. So then we can review each game. It just was, these were kooky ideas. And Microsoft said, we're not going to do that. And I think, frankly, Epic could have just said, they didn't need the lawsuit. Yeah, go ahead, ban Fortnite. See how that works out for you. 
Microsoft says that. GeForce says that. Sony says all the streaming gaming systems. Because do you guys agree streaming gaming is the future of gaming? I love, I mean, I think. I don't know if I necessarily, I think it's a, it's a I think future. it's part of, it's a future. It's part of the future of gaming. I don't, I, I don't think it's the future of gaming. I feel, here's, okay, I'm, I'm a little <laughs> out on a limb on this, but I think that streaming everything is the future of computing. That it just makes more sense to put the computing power, you know, for the first, you know, 50 years of the evolution of personal computing, it's been about pushing the computing to the edge but I think we're contract. It's maybe it's like the maybe it's like the expanding contracting universe. We're now in the contraction phase, where really it makes more sense to put all the computing power in the server, so that you can that you can just as you can do word processing on any device, and your documents are available on every device. That's the power of the cloud for productivity. You could do the same thing with your game. Then you don't have to buy an expensive PC to game or even an expensive console. You could do it on your iPad. That's why I think Apple's missing the boat on this. This is good for the iPad. Some say it's because it's anti-competitive because they have arcade and Apple wants to own the gaming market. I don't know if Apple's that focused. Uh, How well is arcade doing? Do we know? I can't imagine it's doing that, it's well. that well. It's not doing that well. Yeah, it's part of the bundle, the Apple One bundle. Right. And I think that that's going to save Apple TV Plus and save arcade, save News Plus, all three of which I think are not doing that well by bundling it in with stuff that is doing well, like Apple Music and iCloud, which you kind of have to use if you're an Apple user. Um, I'll end up keeping my Apple TV Plus subscription just because it'll come with the Apple One. But really, if I if you give me three things that I really don't care about, that's really going to make me pay up? I, I'm really kind of skeptical about that. Though. Oh, that's interesting. Another. Yeah, good point. So what about, so we saw this transition from uh, to streaming from mo t content. Right. Nobody, nobody, nobody owns. Well, so, OK, I shouldn't say that. That sounds way too blanket. But most people don't buy CDs anymore. In fact, it's gotten to the point now where actually more vinyl records will be sold than CDs this year. <laughs> That's in the story for another time. Uh, everything's streaming. Why? Why even have content on any device? Shouldn't if you could do if you could do an operating system and apps and gaming that way. Wouldn't people want to do this? Isn't that five years down the road? That going to be what computing? Well, looks and, like? and and the point is, the point is, is that it's not just um, uh, whatever the content. It is the the hardware doesn't matter. It it's whatever That's right. screen is at hand. That's right. right. So you know, my kids don't know the difference between playing on their the television versus playing on a handheld versus playing on right. an iPad versus playing on a phone. Like it doesn't matter. The whole point is that computing is it, it, the screen is just the portal, and the computing happens elsewhere. Enthusiasts hate it, but this is the problem with this show and everything we do. We're all enthusiasts, but real people, this is where it's going to go. Enthusiasts are going to, they'll still be people building their own gaming PC in the year 2535. They'll still be people by, <laughs> <laughs> if man is still alive, if woman can survive. Uh, they'll still be, you know, they'll always be people who are doing that. There's still people today who have, you know, turntables in giant sandboxes with, you know, but so there's always going to be that enthusiast market, but I think the mass market's going to move to streaming, certainly in gaming. It's happened in productivity. I read a really interesting piece uh, on it was on Hacker News on the end of desktop computing, in which his premise was Microsoft has lost interest in Windows. This is actually my opinion as well. It, I, it feels like this happening already, because the, at some point the cost of maintaining it's going to exceed the cost. The, the, the value, the, the benefit, the revenue you make from it. And so they're, they're slowly inserting Linux into Windows. And at some point, they're just going to stream it. And, and you know what? At some point, users are going to demand this because every time you install a Microsoft update now, it breaks a finite percentage of users' experience breaks. And people are just bitching and moaning about 2004 and Windows. And I think Microsoft's just at some point going to say, fine, we'll run it. You stream it. You'll stream Windows just like you do anything else. And at some point, it's not even going to matter if you're running Windows. Microsoft's entire business is moving to cloud, to streaming. That's why they're doing xCloud. Their money is in Azure. Uh, Azure actually, Azure revenues have now actually exceeded that of both Office and Windows division. And is so they're already a streaming version of Windows? Yeah. Yeah. Although, I got to point out... Uh, 
by far, Linux is the most popular operating system on Azure, not Windows. So I and, and Microsoft's big the big uh, update with 2004 is to put the uh, WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, so that you have a Microsoft written Linux kernel running in your Windows machine. What does that tell you? Uh, I don't know. I just uh, I feel like <laughs> I know. I'm looking at. I mean, I'm looking at a, a bizarro streaming future. I just feel like that's that's where everything's going to go. So nobody wants to nobody wants to fuss with Windows anymore. Nobody wants to fuss with an operating system. So does the does the coming of Apple Silicon, and uh, what that may enable? I think it's hard to I, give push Apple towards a streaming. Yeah, I think it's backwards. I think Apple is. I'm thrilled about it as an old time computer user, but I think it's actually a little bit of a retro thing to do because I think the desktop processor is mattering less and less. So, but it's not a desktop processor. It's not? It's an iPhone processor. And well, it's all of the things that that system on a chip and what that enables in right. terms of efficiency. Right. I mean, you're essentially, your, your Mac is going to become an iPhone. And, uh, and, all, and, and then if you extrapolate out beyond that, what does that mean for... for I guess computer? you'll need local computing for machine learning, especially with Apple because they're doing everything on device. On the device, right. You'll need it for... Uh, photography. So you're right. But uh, so actually, you're right. That makes sense. Apple Silicon, because it's so customizable, can be mod. It's not an Intel chip. It's not a desktop class computing chip. It's whatever it is needed at the moment. Right. And so it can support the services that you do want to do locally. And then uh, it'll just be uh, internet connectivity that matters. Does it? Somebody in the chat room says Apple Silicon turns computers into appliances. Does that sound right? Maybe. Maybe. Peter, you must, because of your business, <laughs> you must spend a lot of time thinking about things like this. Like, what's the future of computing going to look like? Well, that's a big question, Leo. Um, but, uh, you know, we do think a lot about, uh, I mean, you know, I'm investing in startups, right? And so one of the things we think about is where are the startup opportunity is going to be. Um, if, you know, if everything is run on... Um, you know, from the cloud and it's big companies that dominate what can be built in the cloud, what are the startup opportunities going to be? Um, I'm not super cynical and, and, and think that it's going to be, that there's no opportunities for smaller players to be able to build things. Um, but I do think that there are some advantages for people being able to, um, you know, locally execute code uh, and the things that you can build. And I think not necessarily, um, you know, when it's an entirely cloud-based system, um, you know, the restrictions on what you can do are going to be uh, much stronger. Uh, and certainly like the ability, you know, you, you talk about having a kill switch with TikTok earlier. Um, it's it's uh, much easier to kill something, you know, from, from if TikTok is just an app that's uh, streaming from, right. you know, the Apple server somewhere. Um, it's really easy for Apple to s switch that off. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of implications for this that you know, talking about like unintended consequences, a lot of this stuff, you know, you're worried about big company, big tech companies having even more control over the future well, of, they would, of, uh, they? of things yeah. um, when everything is streamed off their servers. And there's really only going to be a handful of companies that can do this. Um, you know, I mean, there's only really like three companies that can do. That's the cloud, incentive. You know, yeah. I can do cloud, cloud gaming, right? right. It's, it's, it's Amazon, uh, it's Google and it's Microsoft yep. right now. Yep. Uh, and uh, it'd be even tough for, for Facebook to get into that business right now. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that's that, an uh, argument that that's going to it's going to happen, that those companies are going to be pushing really hard for that to happen. Arguably, arguably. But but, you know, but the time to be investing in the infrastructure is now. Right. Yeah. I mean, if Facebook wants to compete, it's not they can't start in three or four years to build out that. But that doesn't Facebook have particular skill in network scaling? I mean, they must. They have two, uh, and a, uh, two billion users. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, they have those but, but skills. I'm, I'm just saying it's non-trivial. That's all. And, yeah. and we've seen, you know, the fact that, I mean, Apple has struggled around cloud services, right? It's been, it took them uh, a, right. a while to catch up to everybody else. And, and I'd say arguably they're still catching up in a lot of ways. That's right. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's been interesting, you know, to see the alliance, so to speak, that's developing between Microsoft and Apple when it comes to the cloud. Uh, you know, they are also really well aligned around privacy in a way that, uh, you know, Apple wouldn't be with, you know, Google or Facebook uh, around this stuff. 
So one of the other big stories of the week is app is a Microsoft buying Bethesda, which is a big game developer, for seven and a half billion dollars, which is, I mean, even for Microsoft, a hefty amount of money. Bethesda does uh, Doom, they do Fallout, they do Elder Scrolls, um, and uh, uh, they do, um, what else? There's some of the uh, other big games. Those are big enough, certainly. Fallout. Fallout. Fallout, yeah. yeah. This is a huge play for Microsoft to become big in gaming. And you really have to ask, wh why would Microsoft spend more money on Bethesda than they did on GitHub? GitHub makes sense for Microsoft, but why why gaming? And I think that this is more evidence that this is that this is the future, that this streaming gaming thing. It's not, I mean, it's you could say, well, initially it's about Xbox. They have a new Xbox coming out, and they need more exclusive titles. But they, I, they, they, I think they, they have a longer term have, strategy. They have, they immediately have the exclusives for this gen launch, right? Right. right. But going forward, in the same way that you're like, well, who am I going to subscribe to? Netflix or uh, Apple TV Plus, or right. you know, like it's content. It's all just content. It's content, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I came. I was. I, I'm feverishly looking for the number, but like, I think that their their internal studios is like now at thirty or something. Like it's this, huge. this jumps them up to the nev yep. the number of uh, gaming studios that they have internally. And somebody pointed out that is such a big number. Sony can't couldn't even look at it. Their revenue doesn't even approximate that. It's yeah. it's it's not. It's at a scale that so even Sony with their PlayStation cannot contemplate. And also, in terms of prestige. It puts the it puts that deal in kind of in the same category as all the ones that Disney has made with Marvel and Pixar. Yeah. And Lucas, I think that Lucas. that's really the way to think of it now. It's really interesting. Right. It's it's content. Right. It's not. It's like Netflix buying you know spending billions on content. It's that's what it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'd Microsoft wants to be the Disney of games. Yeah. So I, I would say two things about this. I think one is you know Microsoft is taking a different strategy for this next generation than. Sony, right? They're focusing on Xbox being something you subscribe to, like Brian said, and you can consume across lots of different platforms and not just via streaming. I mean, you can download games and play them on your Xbox or your PC. Uh, but that's what they're trying to think of. They're trying to shift it to recurring monthly revenue rather than you buy a console every, you know, seven years and then you may, and then they get a cut of some of the, the trend, you know, the, the titles that you buy. Um, I think the other part to your point, what you're saying about content, Leo, is that you know, they're buying these universes, right? Yeah. Uh, these fictional settings. And I think that's, uh, you know, what, I think the idea that Skyrim could be a fictional setting uh, that people care about as much as, you know, a Star Wars or I do. Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, that is not implausible. No. And, uh, uh, and I think that, that, and actually I, I did a, a, something about this, I'm working on something on the side about these shared creative universes, about sort of GitHub for fictional settings. The idea of like, how do you, you know, uh, create a platforms where people can collaborate together to create these fictional worlds, um, not just the, the the stories themselves, but the lore and the maps and the genealogies. There's and, a know, term. Peter, you, Peter, you said you wanted to invest in metaverses, right? That's that's it, right? Yeah. Now, right? Well, metaverses, metaverses, I think, are the three D instantiations of these, right? Um, what people. But you, you, like, but you're saying like where I can go to hang out with people to collaborate yep. with people. That's the metaverse, yeah. There's a theory, I can't remember, Peter, in your research, you probably come across this, and I can't remember the term. It's like metaverse, but this is the Lucas theory, which is you create a giant universe with multiple entry points, movies, yep. comic books, action figures, you name it, and that it all becomes one brand that is a marketing uh, behemoth, is an economic behemoth. I can't remember the term for that, but so there's, Lucas there's pioneered it. Yeah, but there's a par it's called paracosm sometimes. Yeah, um, that's the word. Uh, yeah, uh, and um, that's which I what I might call my project. Um, but uh, you know, I think that part of it is that people are going to have these paracosms or or fictional settings or or creative universes that they invest a lot of time in as fans and as co-creators. Um, and I think that um, you know, owning one of them is going to be incredibly valuable. And I think that the fact that Star Wars was able to transition from a story to a setting. Uh, was, you know, why it was, I mean, it was undervalued at, what was it, $4 billion. Um, It's clearly was worth more than that oh, even man. at the time. Yeah. Um, but I think that, like, you know, if you think about like, where people are going to spend their time, um, 
you know, consuming content and hanging out with their friends, it's going to be, they might only have like two or three of these that they care about. And if you can own one of them and have something that people subscribe to, um, you know, to access and participate in, um, it's going to be incredibly lucrative going forward. And I, I think that, I think 10 years from now, the idea that we may spend a lot of our time, you know, investing in co-creating, uh, some sort of fictional setting it, that does not seem ludicrous at all to me. No, and you can already think about the exemplars of this. Lucas is the first Star Wars, but there's Marvel, uh, there's yep. Middle Earth uh, for the Tolkien fans. There's the Harry Ter Potter, Potter universe, yep. and and these Star have Trek. Star Trek. Star they've Trek. taken a life of their own. I mean, Harry Potter has gone so far beyond the books and the movies, even and the games. Uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a part of the Universal theme park. This is really interesting to watch. Well, and, and so and so, what's the best-selling entertainment franchise of all time? Anybody know off the top of their head? Uh, it's not Doctor it's Who. James Bond, isn't it? Is it it's James no. Bond? What it's is Grand it? Theft? Grand Theft. Grand Auto. Theft Auto. Holy uh, cow! In terms of dollar value, it's Grand really? Theft Auto. Holy yep. cow! Uh, and you know, and and it's and, and what's also the best-selling game every year right now? It's Grand Theft Auto. Still, seven years after still. Grand Theft Auto Five came out. That's and depressing. Because of Grand Theft that's Auto, a horrible universe. <laughs> it's but it's because of, of Grand Theft Auto Online. And, yeah. You know, it's funny. Is Rockstar didn't even anticipate. I mean, the online part was sort of an afterthought seven years ago, but now it's a living, breathing place where people role play. And what is fascinating about Grand Theft Auto Online is like, it's not just about being a gangster or whatever. People are like, oh, I, I have a store, you know? Yeah. Like, I just like sell stuff. Or I just I, like, I just, yeah, I'm just a little shopkeeper. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and by uh, the way, who owns Rockstar? Tencent. Too. Tencent. China. No, it, it's, it's take, take Two Interactive ones. Oh, it's Take Two. Okay, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Tencent. <laughs> Tencent owns, um, they own 40% of Epic. Which Epic. Owns but, but then Nasdaq, also which League is of South Legends. African company, owns a big part of Tencent. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's complicated. Like well, right. Leo, Leo to, to defend you, like China has bought up so much or it has pieces. It's hard to so keep track of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, they have the gaming some, I, industry, especially. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, man. I thought I had a really good one. <laughs> Can, is this a gesture? <laughs> Uh, Tencent, let's <laughs> Tencent is clear. No, but Tencent is clearly interested in this, right? I mean, sure. they think they are investing in things that are building the pieces of this. And I think sure. if there's one company that is best positioned to, you know, benefit from this transition, it's going to be Tencent. Yeah. And if you want to, so if you are a, a nation state looking to dominate economically, uh, looking to become a world power, what better way than to own a few multiverses, a few paracosms that are you know, already in people's heads. If I could buy QAnon, I would buy it. That'd be a good thing to own these days. Let's take a little break. <laughs> I'm joking. Joking. No one can own QAnon. Uh, our show today is brought to you by Extra Hop, the new IT reality. We're talking about it, aren't we? Remote access on a massive scale, rapid cloud and multi-cloud adoption, Internet of Things everywhere, and you know what? It's all vulnerable to cybercrime. It's so important that as an organization, you can see what's going on in your environment, all the way from the cloud to the data center to the customer. That's, in, that's to scale your business. It's also to protect your business. And you need more than just, you know, visibility. You also need to understand what you're seeing. So when you get a threat or a detection, you can respond to it quickly and intelligently. And that's what ExtraHop does. And by doing it, it helps businesses stop breaches 70% faster. It helps you keep your business secure. Uh, SaaS-based cloud-native network detection and response. Uh, lots of people use ExtraHop to keep an eye on their network. Wizards of the Coast, you know, these are the Magic the Gathering folks. They uh, support their AWS cloud with ExtraHop. We talked to Dan McDaniel. He's their chief architect and information security officer. He said, quote, there's no other company that aligns to supporting our DevOps model, the speed and the lack of friction, then ExtraHop. Ulta Beauty uses ExtraHop to secure their Google Cloud and keep their networking and security teams closely aligned so engineers have more time to focus on innovation. If you think about Ulta, they have branches, they have stores all over the world. They've got a huge cloud to monitor 
with transactions going back and forth. Senior IT and engineer at Alta, John Kreese, says, before ExtraHop, we had limited visibility to what was going on in the cloud. But now we can quickly identify vulnerabilities and exploits and understand how our applications are performing in the cloud. You need to know what's going on. And if you want to see an incredible demo, go to extrahop.com slash twit and see what that dashboard looks like. You can learn more about how Extra Hop stops breaches 70% faster. That free trial is there. And it's just a cool, it's just a cool demo of, of knowing what's going on in your network. Extrahop.com slash twit. Extrahop.com slash twit. Secure your environment from beginning to end with Extra Hop. Uh Quibi. Oh. <laughs> oh, I guess um, that Quibi is not creating a paracosm. They are now seeking to sell themselves less than six months after launch the $2 billion play. I have to admit, a little schadenfreude because I look at Hollywood. I know they're looking at YouTube and saying, how can we look at those kids over there on YouTube and TikTok? How can we get into that? Oh, yeah, well, what we need is uh, Chrissy Teigen as uh, a judge. That'll do it. And then short seven-minute videos, and you can turn it sideways. I don't know what you would be buying if you bought Quibi at this point, but I can guarantee don't you. Don't forget, Leo, Jeffrey Katzenberg said that he knows more about oh, content. That's right. Than, or I, I can't remember what the quote was. Than, that he was doing content before you were born. I'm doing, I invented <laughs> Shrek, God damn it! <laughs> okay, Jeff, chill out. Uh, actually, I'm told he's incredibly litigious. So I'm sorry, Jeff. You're a nice guy. You're a <laughs> nice guy. Um, I'm not. I'm not celebrating their failure. Uh, it's just you know it's well, you hard. Know, it's hard to do what, uh, what these guys are doing. To bring it back to TikTok, uh, I, I I again can't find this. I've been searching feverishly, but someone on on Twitter made the excellent point that what if uh, Quibi became the premium version of TikTok? Oh, TikTok. That's not a bad idea. TikTok premium. So, and I've said this before, so I apologize if you heard it before, but what this really illustrates is the very different models that Hollywood has versus uh, social media on the internet. YouTube and TikTok succeed because they made platforms where for whatever reason, users just want to put a lot of content on there. Millions of videos every day. Just upload, upload. And then all they had to do, they've got all this content, and all they have to do is come up with an algorithm that surfaces the most popular content and profit. Meanwhile, Hollywood has this completely different model. You spent all this money up front. You know that most of the things you develop will be flops. You hope that one out of 10 is a big enough hit to make enough money to make up for all the other ones. And then, you know, you put it out there. And I think we have a winner. I think we just, we just have a winner. Uh, it's pretty clear that YouTube and TikTok and, and basically social media in general it's just a better way of doing it. And I think Hollywood should just give up. Well, Quibi has a, I mean, it's a scarcity mindset, right? This idea That's right. That the problem was that good content was scarce because, yes. you, you know. It's the uh, ego of saying only I know how to do content. Yeah. And, and, and I think that they thought there was a gap in the market that clearly was not there. Right. Um, whereas, you know, TikTok, I mean, part of the, there's a lot of things that work really well about TikTok, right? The algorithm is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and what ByteDance, you know, brought to bear there with the acquisition of Musical.ly, um, you know, Musical.ly was not working really before. I mean, it was sort of working, but applying the ByteDance, ByteDance's personalization algorithm, you know, supercharged everything. But the other thing that is underappreciated about TikTok is the tools make it really, really easy to riff off of other people's work. Um, and to create something and and engage in this sort of flow of content. Um, and I think lowering the bar to participation is something that is, you know, uh, uh, really meaningful um, and made a big difference and, and and created this abundance of content that when you have a good algorithm for servicing the best stuff, those two things paired together, uh, you know, make something that a lot of people find very, very compelling. Uh, Quibi, you know, is sort of the inverse of all of that. Yeah. Well, full stop. Full stop. <laughs> Lesson <Yeah>. learned. <laughs> Lesson learned. Um, the thing is, who, who among us, when we heard about Quibi, said, oh, no. No, that's not no. You don't I did. did yes, you? I just said no. Yeah, we all thought it was a flop. Yeah. But, you know, right, but, I, right. but in their defense, I remember people thinking Hulu was going to be a flop. 
Um, remember how, Aaron how King Hulu, called it Clown, called how, it clown Co? Yeah, that was how, flu, how Hulu is not a flop is <laughs> mind-boggling. Yeah, but so, I was just saying, like, sometimes we can be wrong, right? Oh, yes. Uh, and we don't always know. Oh, yes. Um, well, though in, my favorite, in theory... I, in theory, Netflix uh, took the Hollywood model of we're going to throw a, a true, ton of money true. at good content, and it's going to matter. Good point. In fact, they're they're doing all right, right? Five Republican senators have asked Netflix, <laughs> please don't make a movie out of a Chinese science fiction novel. What is wrong with these people? Uh, it is, by the way, a fantastic uh, I think it's a trilogy, right, John? The three-body problem. Yep. We loved it. Uh, uh, Liu Qi Xin wrote it. Uh, Netflix bought the rights to it. <laughs> Senators Kevin Kramer, Marsha Blackburn, and others uh, said, "We don't, we don't like this guy because he's uh, he's a China, he's parroting Chinese Communist Party propaganda. So you shouldn't make a movie out of it." Netflix says, you yeah, uh, know, there's no, nothing in here about Uyghur Muslims. We're going to make the movie. Um, now, admittedly, uh, I'm disappointed to know that uh, Liu, uh, you know, thinks the Chinese are doing the right thing with the Chinese, with the, with the Muslims. That's clearly not the case. But I think you can still make the movie because it's a really good book, right? We're looking forward to it. We're looking forward to Foundation. See how Apple does with that. That'll be interesting. So you're yeah, right. There's still a, there's there's plenty of life left. Plenty of gas left in the Hollywood model. I have, shouldn't. Say have that, you reread but... Foundation recently? No. Why should I? Should I not? Because I kind of find it really boring. And I I'm uh, there's there's two things that I came to in the last three or four years that I had never read that are, you know, embarrassing to me, which is the, all the Dune books what? and Foundation. I'm kind of right, jealous. Know, listen. I'd love to read Dune for the first time again. So I read Dune and I was like, oh my God, I get it. Yep. I can see where everything came from. Yep. I can see where Star Wars came from. I can see yep. everything. And I'm slogging through the Foundation books and it's like. It was a pretty, it was a long time wait, ago. Where, how it, far along are, where are you? I read them. Second, uh, second one. And I don't know that I can continue. <laughs> you got to get to the second foundation stuff. Okay, I'm not very That's far where, into the second. Yeah, it, it, it. I don't know. I, when I, does I, second foundation begin? It's not in the second book. It's not in the second book. No, no, no. You got You got many, many more books. Yeah. Well, you, wait, Pete, Pete. Explain this to me because it starts me, in the third. It starts piece. in the third of them. So third. you got to get through yeah. the second, get to the third. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let me give you my beef. But this is feels, 1953 this was written. That's what I was going to say. It feels to me like watching a science fiction movie from the 50s well, where I can see the black and white and right, like right. the dialogue is – so like I can't – I don't know what is – I'm trying to get to the ideas that I'm like – it's similar with Dune where it's like I see the ideas. I see how these tropes uh, generated – it's like the – the you know, this band created a 300 other bands even though they never sold anything. I, I don't know what the ideas are yet that are going to blow my mind. I, you know, I, there's the stuff related to the second foundation where it's sort of like everything's like a reversal. Like everything sort of gets reversed. Mm. You know, I don't want to spoil things, but like, okay, that's okay, yeah, really yeah, don't, interesting don't, where, he, okay. where it's suddenly it's like, <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, wow, like, you know. Okay, so I'm still it. at the table setting, and the table set, uh, the table setting is not appetizing yet, but if I actually stick with the meal, I'll get it. Yes, and I will say this saying that, like, it, it's sort of the, you know, the, it, it peaks with the second foundation stuff. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> I have okay, to admit, okay. I read this in high school. Which was practically right. the fifties, right. so I, I probably might have the same reaction had I not read it till today, Brian. I and if you have, if you hadn't seen everything you've seen yeah. since in science yeah. fiction, yeah, I read it if for you the go first back time and read like a lot five years ago, older, and I enjoyed it. Really? Okay. Yeah. I've been saying before Apple look, comes out with it, I want to reread it because I, I am I am of a strong opinion that in sci-fi you should always read the book before you see the movie. If unless you, it's a um, Star Wars, unless it's, it's a Star Wars because, book, <laughs> because it was written after the movie to I, capitalize I'm not, there, on it. There, there's been certain um, um, sci-fi stuff, like uh, is it Discworld or it's Discworld uh, is so good, right? Oh. Which is which is so good, and but it's so in the 70s or late 60s or whatever that yeah. was written. But I still loved no, it. No, Heinlein because, has that same problem where sometimes you go, oh, it's cringy because he's yes, you right. know he's all the women are buxom and <laughs> you know it's kind of cringy. But 
or even what is it forever war like that was another yeah. one that very felt very 70s to me but yeah. i still loved it yeah i know on the say on the other hand i'm not modern science fiction sometimes i can't get into it because it's postmodern somehow in a way that i don't I kind of like classic science fiction a little bit. I'm I'm trying to read right now the first Expanse book, Leviathan Awakes. Yeah, that's supposedly very good. I started it, but I have yes, to, but yeah. it's so the the TV series was so faithful to it right. that you already know like it. There's you know it's like I've I saw there. already I already saw the spoilers, <laughs> and uh, Ray Bradbury is one who has hold. Oh has held man, is he? Held held. Go back and read yeah. Ray Bradbury. Yeah, he has been. He definitely. Uh, doesn't feel cringy yeah. most of the yeah. time. And Arthur C. Arthur C. Clarke. Love Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke. Clark. He yeah. holds up really yeah. well. I like the classics, but I'm an old man. Um, hey, you can rent a, a, for five pounds, you can rent a goat for your next Zoom call. Cronkshaw Fold Farm in Lancashire, England. By the way, do you love the, the banner on the top of their website? Coronavirus, forcing websites everywhere to add a generic banner message. <laughs> <laughs> Spice up your virtual meetings by inviting along a goat. Got an upcoming video call? Find out if your workmates, friends, and family are paying attention by adding a goat. <laughs> Here's your choice. You can have Mary, Lisa, Elizabeth. They're all very cute goats. I would go for Daisy. This is the goat that was banned from participating in goat yoga due to headbutting other goats away from the humans so she could have all the attention. What to expect from Daisy in your Zoom call? Rage and affection in equal measures. <laughs> then Daisy looks a little crazy. Oh, man, I don't want to end this show, but we are pretty much... We've I've been waiting for the court order, but nothing happened. I don't know if I want to go all the way to midnight. Peter, it's so good to see you again. <laughs> Uh, Peter Rojas, he uh, anything you're at at Beta Works, anything your website rog.as. What is that? Austrian? Rog.as. Rog American, American Samoa. American uh, Samoa. Yeah, that's waited, good. Yeah. I waited. I, I, I waited years to get that domain. <laughs> so. Did somebody else have it? It was um, a Kurdish socialist uh, workers' party. They're had, red. Had Red, right? Yeah. The Reds. Uh, I don't Rojas. even know why they had it. It's something wow. to do with the initials of the party and something like did that. Did you have to uh, buy it from them or did they let it No, last? I just waited for it to expire. Yeah. But I just, like, I set up a reminder to, like, check it constantly. I screwed um, up because the Royal Bank of Canada had Leo.com and they let it go. And I, somebody sniped it. I wish I'd. Um, yeah. Rojas, that's really good. Yeah. R-O-J dot A-S. Peter Rojas on the Twitter. Um, nothing, nothing to plug, huh? No, you got a podcast. Betaworksventures.com. Surely you got a podcast or something. You know what? I did a podcast last year called Zero G where I, I did a history of uh, smartphones from before the iPhone. Nice. Wow. Anchor.fm slash zero, like the number zero and then G. I'm going to listen to it. See, that's a, that's timeless. Yeah, and, it's fun. Uh, and now Brian really wants to get you on his Internet History podcast. <laughs> I do. It's a limited, let's put it this way. There's a great story about Ja Rule. <laughs> ja Rule and the pre-smartphone era. Wow, that's an episode I got to hear. Very good. Brian McCullough, not only... So how often is the Internet History podcast on? Is that a weekly thing or... No, I haven't done one in about a year. I stopped at oh. episode 201. Okay. Uh, uh, listen, if Peter if Peter follows up and bugs me, then he can be two hundred two. <laughs> That's good. You should do it whenever you feel like it. Well, yeah, no, no it's, pressure. Uh, I'm too busy with to not to actually plug things, but the tech meme right home because it's every day, as you say, Leo. Yeah, I don't know how you'd have time to do anything else, frankly. Yeah, and the, uh, the great book on internet history, which I still have. In fact, I meant to bring it off the bookshelf for the show today, but I forgot. How um, the internet happened. How the internet happened. It's great to see you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. And the tech burger himself. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just can't. I see you now as a, just like a slice of tomato, a pickle, some lettuce. <laughs> I don't know why. It's a Houston Chronicles fabulous Dwight Silverman who briefly thought about getting out of tech reporting. Thank God yeah, he changed his mind. They, they keep pulling you back in. Yeah, Houston. I've got, I'll do this column again. I've got a, a newsletter and uh, and who knows what else may uh, scroll a little bit and those pictures should jump into play. 
Oh yeah, it's oh, not. No. They're not. They're well. That's just me. I have. Oh. I am running so many anti. I, let me. I bet you if I turn off my blockers, because it maybe if it's loaded from a third party site or something. Uh oh. Is that in Safari? It's Firefox. Oh, there it is. They loaded. Yeah, there we go. They loaded. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. That that AT and T story is really interesting. They, I did a story last week about. Um, AT&T was about to end the uh, data cap waiver, and it included um, a waiver on access from AT&T, which is their $10 uh, low-income service. And if you get hit with an overage fee on that, it doubles your internet <gasps> price. And, oh, that's uh, terrible. A family's advocate had, uh, uh, had spoken up about it, and I did a story about that. Good for you. And just as we were about to put the story in print uh, on – uh, thir Friday night for Saturday's paper, AT and T emailed me and say it said we're holding off. Good on the uh, and so now it's through the end of the year. So, Good. Um, yeah, because COVID did not something. go away. Kids are still using Zoom to go right. to school. Now right. is and not people the are time. still working from home. Right. Yeah. Right. Good man. How do I subscribe to the Tech Burger newsletter? You go to HoustonChronicle.com slash release notes. It's the one thing not called Tech Burger, and uh, and you sign up for it, and um, and you can uh, and then see the newsletter. It's like its own little publication. Nice. So, uh, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate. Thank it. you for having me. Yeah, no hurricanes in the future. I couldn't believe what no, we, we had two to deal. with I know this year. we're already to the Greek letters, Storm yes. Beta, because yes. they ran it's out beta of names. Was a tropical storm. If 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 Laura had come into Houston, oh boy, uh, that that would have been you know the poor people in Louisiana. It was terrible there. Yeah. But if you had a tropical, if you, had you a remember the flooding that strong, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Houston has uh, unfortunately <laughs> paved over all its watershed. Yes, yes. <laughs> so the we're, water, we got nowhere to go. Yes, yeah. yes. We're we are we are water world in, <laughs> in a rainstorm. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for doing the, the show, you three. We really appreciate it. We do Twit every Sunday afternoon, 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern, 21.30 UTC. You can watch the show happen live. There's live streams of everything we do. At, I don't know why. That was a bad mistake on my part, but we do it. Twit.tv slash live. Uh, there's audio and video streams there. Uh, you can also get on-demand versions of the show because it is a podcast at the website, twit.tv. Uh, there's a YouTube channel. You can always ask your Amazon Echo or your Google Voice Assistant to play This Week in Tech podcast. It'll play the most recent uh, version. That works for all podcasts, including the Tech Meme Ride Home. It's a very nice thing to know about. Although I got stuck, Brian, once in uh, a, a, an episode of The Daily uh, from like mm -hmm. six months ago. And every time I say play The Daily podcast, it plays this old one. And I had to try all, I said, play today's daily, I tried all sorts of things. Finally, I found out if you say latest, play the latest tech meme ride home, you will get mm. the latest one. So that's a little. Do you remember the, Leo, do you remember the Rio riot? Yeah. The, 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 uh, I was right a, before. Yeah, yeah. I love the Rio riot. The Diamond Rio was the first real uh, podcast player. The, the Rio Riot was the first one that had like a 30 gigabyte hard drive, yeah. but it had this funky thing where it would only play uh, Faces. There was this one song by <laughs> Faces, which was Rod Stewart's band, called um, Open to Ideas, which is actually a great song. But I, I came to love it because the Rio Riot would play over and over and over again on any playlist you made. The very last one would always be Open to Ideas by the Faces. So there you go. <laughs> Oh, software. It's amazing, isn't it? By the way, uh, I do want to mention that uh, Walt Mossberg reviewed the Rio riot in the Wall Street Journal and said, if I had never seen Apple Computer's iPod, I would think the new Rio riot was pretty <laughs> cool. So there you go. <laughs> Just a little a trip down memory lane with the Internet historian himself. Brian McCullough. Uh, if you have a podcast player, probably on your phone, but your computer or any device, that's the best way to subscribe. Just get that app there and uh, say subscribe to This Week in Tech. You'll get the episode the minute it's available uh, on a Sunday evening, just in time for your Monday morning commute with your bathrobe and bunny slippers 
from the bedroom to the living room. <laughs> Commutes aren't what they were. They used to be anyway. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, thanks to Jammer B, John Slanina, for running the board today, our uh, technical director. Thanks to our producer, Karsten Bondi. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Another this twit. This is amazing. Okay. Bye.